Today, we're not going to a restaurant. We are going to stay at home in order to enjoy a very good homemade meal, French style. I am still in the south of France and a lot of people romanticize this aspect of traveling. You gotta see all those Instagrammers, mostly them are women who romanticize buying the wine, the little fruits and vegetables, the cheeses, and then making a nice home-cooked meal. So we're gonna do that. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist, let me know where you're watching from. Uh, I had a little bit delay on my train, so I couldn't do prep for the stuff I'm going to cook tonight. And we're gonna have a full, it's supposed to be a four course meal, but we're gonna combine course one and two together. Um, and we're gonna have some wine as well, some rosé. And then you can ask me anything as we're dining. But first, let's get on cooking. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist. Let me know where you're watching from. If you wanna see more of my Airbnb, you gotta tune in after my stay is over. I'm gonna post a video tour of the entire Airbnb. But today we're just gonna focus on the cooking and the chatting. Let's go. So welcome everyone, nice to see you here. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist, and we are right now in the beautiful kitchen. And I got a prep. Um, I got myself a nice rosé. Can't wait to try this out. Let's see how it is a little bit later. Uh, I already got the this getting hot already, which is nice. This has to be hot. And then the oven has to be hot as well. So Caroline says, you look sunburnt. Caroline, that is a fact of life. <laughs> I, I, uh, I get so many of these comments. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a fact of life that when one goes out in a sunny weather, one gets a little bit sunburnt. It's okay. I think a lot of people, especially in the West, especially in the US, uh, have this immense fear, and this happens in certain parts of East Asia too, have an immense fear of getting sunburned. It's okay, ladies and gentlemen. We're out in the sun. It's all celebration. Uh, let's see what, what is in store tonight. So this is not my home. This is an Airbnb um, in the south of France. You're going to see later where I'm at uh, towards the end of my stay. There's, no going, there's not going to be a full tour tonight. Um, this is the kitchen. And let's uh, see what is here. So... The main course is we got a lot of stuff in the fridge. Most of this is mine. There might be a few things that the either previous guest or the Airbnb owner left. This is not their home. They rent this out. Uh, so we're not intruding on someone's home. And we got this. Two things for the oven. And then we got this. This needs to be condimented. And later I'm gonna take out this. I got a nice sparkling water, which I never tried a Reza. Fancy sparkling water, we'll try this later. Keep it chill. And, oh yes, I need this as well. Yeah, some rucola. So Teacup says, what are the quintessential items to travel with? I'll answer questions a little bit later, so keep your questions for later because um, it's gonna be a bit hard for me to answer questions while cooking. Um, but stay tuned, uh, Teacup, ask me that a little bit later. So what's going to be on the menu? Oh, you're about to see. So I gotta, I gotta find space in this kitchen in order to take everything out. So let me put the camera over here. Uh, so welcome, welcome everyone, welcome Gwen, welcome Ron, welcome Raphael, welcome Susie. Susie got her iced coffee, that's amazing. Uh, has everyone got their glass of wine ready, says Kay. Yeah, if you're in Europe, get your glass of wine ready. Or, uh, I don't know, what's a good non-alcoholic alternative to wine, let me know. Not tea, because it might be a little bit too late for tea for Europeans. Hello, Nubu, uh, Nebul, nice to see you here. Hello, Sally. Welcome. So I got to start putting things in the oven because it's going to get... Um, I got I to gotta be sure to have everything coordinated. Uh, is there music? There's music playing in the living room, in the slash dining room. So you can hear in the distance. Maybe not so much. I can't put it louder because it'll bother the neighbors. 
So, I ended up uh, doing shopping earlier today. I thought it was going to be a bit difficult because when I go to uh, New York City uh, or anywhere in America, this also applies to Puerto Rico, you can either buy everything at the supermarket, but the thing is the supermarket, as I mentioned, pre-made foods are not always the best at the supermarket. I don't, for some reason, I don't like the kind of the deli counter of the supermarkets. I've never been a fan. The cheeses, the, the pre-made meats, um, like uh, mashed potatoes, whatever they sell, usually to me is not that good. So I'd rather make it from scratch. So in the U.S., I end up spending a lot more time cooking. Uh, but in France, there are certain dishes that are actually really hard to make on your own. Uh, so you can go to the butchery uh, to, or, the, or the trateur to buy these pre-made dishes so you don't need to spend too much time cooking which is more than okay because A, they're actually really good quality. They're made with local ingredients. And then B, uh, they actually do it with love. You know, they're, they're husband and wife that run a shop or, or, or a young person, whoever they are. They're a, they're a family. There's, there's someone who's running the shop, who owns the shop, runs it, is there, is making the food. They truly love what they do, which you don't always get that personal touch in the U.S., so I thought I was going to spend a lot of time shopping around uh, because I had to go to these different places. I had to go to a, a trateur, to go to a boucherie, to go to a fromagerie for the cheese, and to go to a boulanger for bread and a grocery for the, for the uh, fresh vegetables as well. I thought I had to do a lot of walking because in the U.S. if you want to buy high quality foods at specified places, you will have to do a bit of traveling. In Manhattan, it's a bit tedious. I would have to go uh, maybe within the radius of like 30 blocks. But here, it was within the radius of one block that I had to go to all these shops. They were all next to each other. Oh, it was such a breeze. So in France, especially I assume if you're in bigger cities or bigger towns, probably there's one block with everything. So you'll be okay. So the first thing is... I think a few people are going to be really happy with this one. This is very rare at restaurants. You can't really find this at too many restaurants. At least not in the regions I've been to. I've been to... Um, I've been to Lyon, Paris, Avignon, and here, the South of France. Three regions. This is not popular in any of those regions. I'm not sure where you find um, more of these in restaurants, but this is a souffle. This is a cheese souffle. This is supposed to be the first course, but we're gonna cook this at the same time we're making the meal. I have a feeling this is gonna cook very fast. We actually have a chef tuning in. We have DS tuning in. Welcome DS. DS is a chef uh, extraordinaire. I can't wait to one day try your food, DS. Can't wait to see your show about food. DS is working on the show about food. So we have a cheese souffle. I was gonna use this as appetizer, but we don't have time to separate them. So we're gonna include this with the meal. The other thing we have pre-made, which would make me shudder in New York City to buy something pre-made. But when in France, you gotta enjoy the good cooking of people who already know how to do it. We have I, I don't know how to pronounce this. Dauf, Dauphinois, Dauphinois gratin. Dauphinois gratin. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's amazing thinly sliced potatoes with some cheese cream. Ooh, all slathered together. Ooh, makes my heart skip a beat. Ooh, you can smell the cheese. Oh my god, I'm not sure how this long they'll take. This will probably take about 10 minutes. So I'm gonna put this as, I'm gonna put both of these after I condiment the freshly made thing. What's in the bag? I went to a butchery. I'm gonna need a plate for this. Actually, before I take it out and cover my hands, I'm going to put some seasoning on the plate. Mm. 
Nebul says, put the Gretin before. It'll take a while. You think so, Nebul? And Eleanor says, that's not cooking. Eleanor. It's okay to buy pre-made foods. <laughs> I can't tell you anything, Eleanor. I, I, I'm not going to defend my case. Um, just uh, live life, enjoy life. Uh, I'm not a cooking show per se, so. So I'm going to put some olive oil on the plate right here. Susie says, that's my kind of cooking. Yeah, and in France, I don't think this is too weird. I don't think it's too weird. A lot of people are not making things fully out of scratch. I think you have to spend a lot. If I were to make all this out of scratch, I would have to spend a lot of time. There are, there are things, especially American cuisine, I do enjoy making like my roasted sweet potatoes from scratch, of course. It's not too hard. But uh, start, when you start trying to make these gratin, it's going to take a while. Souffle, I have no idea. Souffle is going to take me a it's going to take me a few hours to learn how to make a souffle and then to preparation it's going to take a while so some things is, is going to take a while so we're going to put some herbs de provence herbs de provence this is very famous in provence Ooh, oh my god it's let me show it to you it's thyme oregano and no not the oregano you're thinking about uh, usually lavender, sometimes allspice, and then it has uh, like two more ingredients. This is very famous in Provence. Why am I, why am I seasoning the plate? You'll, you'll find out why. This makes things a lot easier, trust me. When it comes to seasoning, what, what's need to be seasoned. I'm gonna, I'm gonna smother this in Herbs of Provence. I love Herbs of Provence. Salt. Sea salt. Sea salt is way better than that table salt that you end up getting at major American stores. Ooh. Actually, I need to spread this with my hands. Oh, this is rock salt. Nice. Rock salt. Very coarse. Very coarse rock salt. Yeah. Why did I season the plate? Because of this. A fresh filet, steak filet, French, local. And look at that. And the trick is to season the plate because all you gotta do is this. Just put it on the plate and turn it over. And that's it, you don't need to do too much work afterwards. There we go. Just lather that, all those juices together. Ah, there we go. Not vegan friendly. Not vegan friendly cooking at all, ladies and gentlemen. Are you going to explore the city? Uh, says San anymore at night uh, when you don't light uh, when you don't stream. Uh, no, no, um, no. Uh, I'm a bit tired. Thank you so much for asking. I'm so glad you enjoy my streams, but no, not tonight. I might do a night stream next week. Stay tuned. Love steak, says Wendy. I'm so glad you do, Wendy. I'm so glad you do. That's a large filet. I'm a large man. I, that's it. We're done. No, I'm joking. I'm going <laughs> to go cook this. I'm going to put this gratin. This is going to take a while. Throw this away. So, ladies and gentlemen... I've only done like two cooking shows, three cooking shows in the pandemic. I don't know how to do cooking shows. I don't know how to make them interesting. I'm just gonna put this right out there. Um, I'm very nervous for this cooking show. And 
this might be boring at moments because there's no editing. This is not going to be binging with Babish. It was a really good cooking show. That man cut so fast. Or actually, it's very well, very well planned. It also, it's edited fast. I don't know how I'll do that. Uh, I can't do that. It's live. We can't do that. So this is a very slow process. We're going to take our sweet time. Things might be a bit slow, but that's okay when it comes to cooking. So let's just enjoy a nice smooth experience here. Didn't know there was a rule, says Janet. <laughs> no, there's no rules. 100 degrees Celsius, says Nebu. Oh, Nebu, you know how to cook. I put it at 220, but yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that might be too much. Might burn it. Oh, it's... Nebu, thank you so much. Where's the wine, says Romain? It's coming up soon. It's coming up soon. The wine's right over here. All right, that's heating up. Nice. Steak ready. This is already getting heated up. I gotta heat up the plate even more. All right. Yeah, heat up the plate even more. And then we're gonna put it down. So we're gonna hear, hear that sizzle. Now, I'm debating one thing. And let me know what people think over here. We'll put it to a vote. I put oil, olive oil, good local olive oil, rock salt, and herbs de Provence. But I could put just a tad of another thing. Should I put a tad of red wine onto the steak? I'm not going to make a red wine sauce or anything, but I don't have garlic. I do have another vegetable, actually. I got time. I got to put a timer for this. But should I put just a little bit of red wine? Let me know. Would you do that? I'm going to cut off onions. Yeah. I'm so excited for the onions. I have another type of salt, and you're going to find out what this other salt is for. Uh, so Sarah Wendy says no. Marina says no. Veronique says no. Uh, Dinden says yes. Sarah says no. Margaret says I'm enjoying the Ariel uh, cooking show. I'm glad. Yeah, that's how royals cook their steak. Wendy says I drink the wine. <laughs> I'm good. We're going to drink rosé. Uh, I prefer rosé. Susie says yes. A lot of people, some, wow, it's very mixed. Not while in the pan. Afterwards, you can pour it in the pan. It will mix far better. Ah, so a lot of people are saying the fire element. Interesting. Interesting. My, my, yeah, it might work better after it's already cooking. Interesting. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I appreciate that. No wine, but pepper, yes. I, I, um, I do, do like pepper, but I don't have a good black pepper right now. So yeah, yeah, I wouldn't do pepper. All right, so we're nixing the wine. Thank you so much. We're nixing the wine. All right, so no wine. Thank you so much for your input. Nothing else but butter at the end. Butter would be nice. I also don't have butter. I just have oil. Butter would be nice. Ticking. Cut up these onions. Five minutes to cut up the onions. Go. So Gigi says, "Don't waste good wine on the bad sauce." Okay, thank you. So I'll save that wine. I'll drink it tomorrow. Now let's all cry together as we cut up onions. Oof, this knife is not working. Yeah, that's a lot. 
better. What are you cooking, says Miss Negroni. Gimbal not auto track, no Alma uh, live video. Unfortunately, the live video app doesn't have that feature. I wish I could do auto track, that would be amazing. So I wish I'm cutting up an onion right now because I'm going to put everything together with the steak. Onions are more for flavor. I'm not going to really eat it. Get a little bit teary eyed. You're making me very hungry, says Sally. Yeah. I can imagine. It. Some onions. Okay, ready for the steak? Keep an eye on the oil, says Susie. I did not put any oil in the pan, just on the steak. All right. person for, for a cooking show. A lot neater when I cook, but since I'm doing also filming, it's a bit hard to clean up. Hear that sizzle. Hear that sizzle. We're gonna cook it six minutes on each side. Mark says, need oil. I already put oil on the steak. Put the souffle in, says Carrie. Yeah, Carrie, I think it's souffle. Yeah, the potato, ooh, wow, yeah. Yeah, potatoes might take a while, actually. Six minutes on each side, people are saying? It depends on how strong this stove is. I don't know how strong it is. Uh, so we gotta play it by ear. Um, note everyone, I'm not a professional cook. Uh, so, so I know some, there's some professional cooks out there uh, screaming at the TV screen, potentially. Um, but yeah, I don't know how strong the stove is, so I gotta gauge what it is. At home, I usually only do six and six at medium heat. But here, it might take a little bit longer. Depend also depends on the steak. This steak is also cut pretty thick, so actually it might take a little bit longer than that. So I might do uh, seven and seven or eight and eight, depends. We'll play it by ear. We got time. Time to open up the wine though and cut up the bread. I'm gonna put Gwen says that's a thin steak. Six minutes won't be too long. Yeah. I gotta put this up because um this is not gonna cook fast enough. Lauren says, remember to rest the steak. What do you mean by resting the steak? And uh, do I like it well done? No, I prefer medium rare. 
medium rare for me personally. Debbie says three on each side. Wow, that'll be too low. Way too low, way too low. Is this easier for French food to, is this the easiest French food to prep since the tombster? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's why I felt like buying. There's a lot, a lot harder stuff in French cuisine. Time to make the salad. What's the temperature of the stove? I have a five right now, five. A little less. Just a little bit. Tomatoes. I think two suffice. And then the wine afterwards. I'm so excited. You rest on the plate after five minutes. So it continues cooking. Interesting. A lot of people are saying to let it rest. That's interesting. Interesting. Ooh. Yeah, that's cooking well. The two sisters, rare medium means that there's still blood in the steak yet. No salt until the end, says Ida. Ida? Really? Usually I put salt before. Some people, yeah, I've seen a few food videos on YouTube say that the salt should um, should go afterwards. Let me know what's the, what's the thinking behind that. I think this might be a little bit too much, but you know, watch this. Yeah, that, that's too much. All right. Back to the fridge. Uh, K says, yeah, the salt dries out the steak too much. Hence, that's why it goes afterwards. Interesting. Okay. Too late now. <laughs> I'm going to try it out later another day with, uh, with uh, cooking it afterwards. Are you making a salad in Iswa? No, I'm not. I don't have, um, I don't have the, the anchovies and the tuna. It has to cook just a little bit longer. Smoky. Ah. There we go. Oh, these tomatoes look good. Oh my god. I'll show it to you soon. Wow. Beautiful tomato.
<laughs> Gary says, you're doing well. You have not set off the, the smoke alarm. Look, luckily, there's huge windows here. Debbie says, I need steak now. <laughs> Debbie, you gotta wait. <laughs> There's still like four minutes left. Actually, I might start cooking. This, yeah, this is almost done. A little bit less. Yep, we're almost done. We got the salad. Actually, I'm gonna put some onions as well. Onions too. There you go. And in order to finish off a little bit of this salad, right here, some olive oil. Ooh. Souffle is done. All right, take that with the souffle. Ah, look at this souffle. Ooh, smells like cheese. I love it. Potatoes are gonna need more time. This steak is done cooking. Got the salad. Time to do what people said. Rest the steak, cut up the bread, and serve up the potatoes. So the steak is done. It might be a little bit more medium well. Maybe. I don't know. It's a toss-up. Let's see. Let's see what it is. We'll cut it up later. Let it rest. Huh. There we go. Ooh, souffle's looking good. Yeah, souffle's hot. Yeah, there we go. Pablo says steak looks great. It does, yeah. All right, we need another plate. Oh, I'm so excited. All right. We're gonna open up the bottle of wine. We gotta do a lot of stuff, all right. You would be a fun guy to cook with, says uh, TK. <laughs> I'm glad. All right, bottle of wine. We gotta do this. Time is of the essence, all right? Just to, if you're cooking, just uh, have the sound of Gordon Ramsay playing in your head. Oh, they make ooh, they made this easy. <gasps> I messed up. Is this a twist off? No, I can't. Oh, this is a twist. Wait, no. This can't be a. Twist. What type of cork is this? It's white. That's a weird cork. That's a quirky cork. Ooh, those potatoes. Ooh, they're sizzling. Nice. 
That's a weird ass quirk. What the hell? Nexus is a plastic cork is now unusual. What? What is this? That's so weird. I've never encountered plastic cork before. Let me know how is this normal in Europe? Damn, these Europeans are weird. I don't open too many bottles of wine in my life, so I'm not like super smooth with this. I gotta practice. Oh, plastic quirks are weird. Someone help me. <laughs> that is a weird ass. Wow. That's weird. Oh, anyway. oh. all right. Mmm. Smells good though. It's good rose. It's good to put it back in. It works. All right. All right. It works. Let's start setting up the table, shall we? The potatoes are about to be done. The steak is already rested. Steak has meditated for a little bit. It's good. And we got the souffle. And I cut up some bread. But you know what? I don't got time to do too much cutting. So I'm just going to rip it off. Usually, if I were to serve this with someone, I would I would cut it more neatly. But I'm just gonna, just gonna. There we go. Bread. Steak is looking good. That's awesome. Now for the potatoes. Please show the bottle front. It will do. But you gotta be quiet. The potatoes are about to come out. The potatoes. Don't start on them. Don't start on them. these potatoes. so good mm. oh my god I swear it's the onions that are making me tear up it's not the potatoes I swear it's the onions oh, oh my god what wow that's potatoes Oh, ooh, 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 yes. We got one thing to put on these potatoes. One thing.
white truffle salt for just a small little pinch. to give that truffly taste to the beautiful potatoes. Voila! And a little pinch of Herbes de Provence on the salad. There we go. Salad needs a little bit of Herbes de Provence. There we go. Nabu says, warm up the bread for in the oven for a minute. No, I'm not going to do that. Good suggestion, but the bread is, is uh, just bought a few hours ago, so it's still very good and nice. So no, but thank you for the recommendation. All right. Ooh, this is going to be a good meal. And I got to get the sparkling water, too. Can't do it without some good sparkling water. Oh, yeah. And then the final two courses are going to come after. So stay tuned. Is your Airbnb nice? It is. Yeah, you'll see more of it. Um, I'm going to do a quick tour later. So sparkling water. There we go. We got an Urbanist coffee break plane right over here. Views outside. There's not too much to see outside. You'll find out later where, uh, where I stayed. I'm going to po post the link of my Airbnb at the end of my trip. Dim the lights, Ariel, says Miss Lob. You know, I wish I could dim the lights. These lights are too white. You, trust me. I... I'm, I'm picky about my coffee. I'm picky about my pastries. I'm picky about my lighting. It's okay. It's not the best lighting conditions. I wish I could do something else. If this were my home, oh, trust me, I would have the perfect lighting conditions. Is it cold now? Oh, we just gotta go. But unfortunately, I'm doing a live video, so I gotta turn on the lights. Because unfortunately, when it comes to video, it needs as much light as possible. Otherwise, you won't see too much and the quality will be too low. Mmm, that's so good. See how this is. Oh, this looks like a good sparkling water. <gasps> wow. Oh my God. I love sparkling water. No, oh, it's the best thing ever. Sparkling, I'll show you all the bottles after, but let's let's get right into the food. Pistol says, okay, let, now let's talk about UFOs. <laughs> you can't after, after, while I'm eating. Stay tuned, Pistol, while I'm eating. So let's cut up the souffle. Ah, oh, interesting. Ooh, oh, it looks like a canal, too. And let's see how the steak cooked. Ah, the steak cooked. 
medium well. Medium well. This was a medium well. Nah, more like medium. It's not focusing well. The annoying thing about uh, the iPhone live video kind of sucks at focusing, but yeah, it's medium well. And Tony says, to be honest, your steak is cold. Well, it happens, Tony. It happens, you know. I'm doing this alone, Tony. I'm doing this alone. And you can fret if you're alone. Or you can just go with the flow. Wow. Mmm. 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 So juicy. Wow. Really juicy. The herbs of the Provence adds a great quality to it. Oh, wow. Now for the souffle. Oh, that's a good souffle. Wow. All right. Interesting. It is a strong rosé. Very fruity. Wow. Very fruity. It's rather tutti fruity. Yeah, I get notes of tutti fruity candy. That's good. All right, let's try the 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 potatoes and see how they are. Ida says, "Is it a cheese souffle?" Yeah, it is a cheese souffle. Wow, those are some mighty good potatoes. Really, really cheesy. Done really well. Very creamy. Wow. Mmm. Oh, wow. That's so good. All right. This was a meal success. Meal success. And, of course, some uh, greens as well, which is nice. You got to have some greens with your steak. Mmm. I'm going to try these tomatoes. Yeah, wow. Good tomatoes as well. The arucula. Mm, delicious. Really good food. That's that's amazing. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. No, I'm talking. <laughs> now as I eat and dine, feel free to ask me anything. Uh, how much do all of the ingredients cost? I spent quite a bit. Um, this is easily for two, so I end up buying a lot of portions for, basically this could have been for easily for two. The butchery I spend, the butchery I bought the steak, the souffle, and the potatoes. I spend 16 euro, 16 euro around there. Yeah. Wait. wait. The bottle of wine? About uh, seven euro. But again, this is a, do you share this or keep it for later? So 16 euro is what I'm eating on the plate right now, which is, I think, reasonable for a very good steak, very good potatoes. At the restaurant, you would spend maybe 20 euro for this if it were a low cost restaurant. 
Um, if you were here in Nice, this would cost you more. This would cost you about 30 euro. Uh, and this is the wine, Saint Patrice. Really good, 2021, from the Provence. Teacup says, what are your quintessential items for traveling? Backpack. Um, when it comes to my camera gear, but that's more for if you're a content creator. Tony says any pudding. Basically, you could think of the souffle as like a cheesy black pudding. I mean, not black pudding, cheesy Yorkshire pudding. So teacup, backpack is 100% necessary. For me, shaving gear. But of course, that's male centric mostly. Um, I'm gonna need um, good toothpaste. I don't like um, the big brands, so I tend to use Burt's Bees toothpaste. And I like uh, a good suntan lotion, Sun Bum, I use in the US. Sandy Pandy says, left side or the right side of the bed? It really does depend. I kind of switch over a lot. I tend to go more towards the right side, actually. Mm. Pistol says go to Corsica. I don't have time. It would be cool to go to Corsica. Was there even ferries to Corsica? And someone sent a super chat. Hey! Thank you so much uh, for letting me know. Uh, Brett says, so far France has been my favorite part of your European trip. I especially like Paris, but now you do a cooking show. Very cool and worth the super chat. Thank you so much. Brett. Brett is sponsoring part of this uh, nice meal, home-cooked meal. Thank you so much. So yeah, 16 euro for the uh, steak souffle and potatoes. Pretty good price. Uh, the veggies, less than 5 euro. Uh, the wine, 7 euro. The bread, 1 euro. Basically 1 euro 10. Not too bad for entire baguette. Mm. Teacup says, do you cut your own hair? No, I do not. Mm, wow. Ludo asks, do you find any good sun oil? No, not yet. I'm, I'm basically using the same one I always use. Lauren says, good price for bread. It is kind of regulated here. Sally says, and a lot of other people ask, am I, am I homesick? No, not homesick. I love my home. I love my family. Uh, I love friends. Um, I love New York City. But no, I'm not homesick. Have you, ha have you had it cut in countries? What, what do you mean? What do you mean, Teacup? Do let me know. Susie says, I can't think of a question. No worries, Susie. This is a mighty good souffle. Wow. Now I can see why people rave about souffles. Mmm. It reminds me of a Leonese canal, which is one of the best things you can ever try in your life, in my opinion. This is my best dish in my entire trip has been the Leonese canal, which is a, like a, a fish souffle, white fish souffle. Doreen says, that's why you're good at what you do. Oh, thank you, Doreen. Do you get lonely in your travels, says uh, Sally. It does depend. It does depend, yeah. 
It does depend. I feel like I want to make more friends traveling in places abroad, but it's hard with the language barrier. And then, um, you know, a lot of people who are international travelers kind of already, especially if they're American, they're already with groups of people. Uh, so, but I've had nice times going to tours, food tours specifically, and meeting people. It's very nice. And subsequently having dinner with them or hanging out with them afterwards. That has been nice, yeah. And then we follow each other. And the cool thing is I have met a few people like in going to food tours. So, uh, for example, last year in Greece, I met a few people. But I met specifically one person uh, who, who was from Manchester. And then when I went to Manchester, we ended up uh, hanging out, having brunch. It was really cool. So we hung out both in Greece and, and over there in Manchester. Um, yeah, I've met many people. Which was nice. Susu asked about getting homesick. No, 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 homesick. Um, you look right home at there. Wow, to three months. Hmm? Yeah, three whole months I've been here. Three months. Uh, someone asked me, as an educated person, what do you think of French people? So French is not a monolith. So you have to take that in consideration. There's different regions of France. And some countries are a bit more homogeneous. So what's a good example? Ireland. Ireland is going to be a little bit more homogeneous than the France. Uh, maybe with the exception of Northern Ireland, but Ireland itself, yeah, there's some minor differences. There are some differences, but it's a bit more homogeneous. Uh, and you have a few places, like, if you were to count the entire area of Ontario, Canada, it's going to be pretty homogeneous. But France, there are a little bit more regional differences. And, but if I were to generalize, I would say, excuse me. If I were to generalize, I would say um, the French really like the politeness. There is a really high emphasis on politeness. People want to, you have to be polite in the beginning. And French people do notice a little bit more of the flaws of any experience, especially if it's a culinary experience. They notice more of the flaws. Um, some people would say if you were to Frame it negatively. Some people might say French people like to complain. Some French people have told me that, that there's an art of complaining in French, in France. Um, and I would say that's pretty accurate because when you look at Google Maps reviews, for example, of food, uh, you end up seeing really negative reviews. They're really good places to eat that have like 3.8. I've learned and in, in New York City, I would never go to a restaurant that's rated below 4.1 because it tends to be terrible food if it's rated in 3.6, 3.7, 3.8. It'll be terrible restaurant, generally, in, in the U.S., especially in New York. Don't go. And it also applies to England, it applies to many other countries around the world. But in France, you can have a really excellent restaurant rated 3.8. Uh, so there's a little bit more of a tougher character. Uh, Pistol said it right. There's a bit more of a tougher, tougher character with the French. So I would say that. But after that, I think the French do open up. They do open up, but not via small talk. You can't small talk your way to opening up a French person, I think. The best way to open up with French people, I think, is to really get in deep fairly quickly. And they value a lot of intellectual discourse. So I would say that. I would say that's, that's the easiest way. It's not like in Ireland or in many parts of England where, and in America too, where small talk is king. You, you can, small talk is the way to really get close to people quickly. You talk about the weather in many parts of the U.S., Ireland or, or England slash Scotland. But here you can't really talk about the weather. You can't really talk about uh, generally how's your day going. You got to get a little bit deeper.
Neville says we love to talk. Oh yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I can see that with the French. Yeah, but that's my observation as an American, of course. Ne Neboul says we don't care about the weather. I could tell. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating history, actually. Yeah, everyone talks about the weather in Ireland. That's that's how you get any Irish person to open up. Talk about the weather. But here in France, that won't fly. It won't fly. I gotta keep playing the the music because it stopped. It's like they have a feature where it automatically stops. Ooh, this is really good food. I'm getting more red because I'm eating a lot of cheese. You have something on your lips, says Matt. Thank you so much, Matt. Appreciate that. And also, I'm drinking wine. Miss Lob was referring to uh, people in Ontario. Okay. Someone asked me, where is Ontario? Ontario is in Canada. But it's a big region of Canada. Wendy says, how do you measure success? Success... People, some, some people say it's a zero-sum game. I don't think so. I think there's two ways of really describing success. There's a very earthly way of describing success. Um... In a very grounded, earthly way, success is the ability to provide for yourself and for others. And that's that. I think that's success. If you feel you're adequately providing for yourself and for others, it depends who you want to provide for, but especially as a man in society, um, it's nice to provide for a family, so, and people would like to think different, but this has been the case for, for millennia. It's, it's nice to provide for a family. So I think that's the true measure of success, is you're providing for people. You provide for yourself and for your family. Regardless who your family is, it could be, it could be a, a significant other, it could be kids, it could be uh, parents, it could be whatever, you can define your family whatever way you want to. It could be a company. Whatever way you want to define your family, if you're providing well for your family and for yourself, that's success. Simple than that. Everything else is, is extraneous. Everything else is extra cherries on top. So uh, having a, a yacht or, or a, in my case as a filmmaker, Oscar winning, Palme d'Or winning film, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all extraneous. It's all extra stuff. It's nice that it's nice to complete goals, but this is it's just stuff. It's just things. Doro says, "Are you Indian?" No, I'm not Indian. Uh, Doro, <laughs> uh, there's not that many Indians that look like me. It's it's not it's not that common. To so, no, no, I'm not Indian. So and then success, I would think, um, more spiritually, is love. Love. It's as simple as that. Just love. Love what you do. Love who you are. Love who you're with. Love the people you see. Love your friends. Love your family. Love the world. No matter how people say it's shitty, it's terrible, ugly, vicious, poisonous, whatever adjectives people use. It could be anything. Just love. It's, a, it's very hard. That's a measure of success that is not easy. Not easy at all. You think you might think it's easy. It's easy to love a significant other. It's easy to maybe love your parents as well. It's easy to love kids, your own kids. It's easy to love a dog. It's not as easy to love the ugly parts of the world. 
It's not as easy to love the mistakes that people do. It's not as easy to love the mistakes that you have done. It's not easy. But if you get there, I think you're very successful in this life. Max is quoting the Beatles. Yeah, all you need is love. That's right. Cynthia says, are you a frustrated priest? No. I'm not frustrated nor a priest. <laughs> Laura says, uh, success can be getting over fa failure. Yeah, let us know what's your um, de definition of success. Yeah, you're right. Uh, success can be getting over failure. Do you think destiny is a matter of chance or choice? Ooh. That's a good question. Mm. This has been a great meal. Ron, that's a great question. My point of view, and this point of view is shared with, with a lot of people around the world, is you think of life as a movie. You're the writer, you're the director, and you're the editor. And in every movie, hence our lives, there's a script. That script, like in the movies, is a blueprint of how the movie is going to develop. But unlike a movie, where you write the script first, you direct, and then you edit, you're doing all these three things concurrently. So in film, you write the script, which is the blueprint. Scripts are not exactly what's going to end up on the screen. It almost never happens. Scripts are meant to be a blueprint. In Hollywood, if you write a script where it's describing so fully what the finished product is going to be, generally producers won't work with you. So, you, script is the blueprint, then the direction, directing. You direct it, you direct the actors, you direct the, 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 the extras, excuse me. You direct, um, you direct. You direct the, the visual effects people, you direct the, the grips, you direct the lighting, you direct the, the, the cinematography, right? You direct all of this. Cool thing is, while you're directing, you can change the direction of the script. You can change a line. You can change a scene. You can dare even change the ending. Many directors have done that. And then comes editing. Editing, you can rearrange the scenes. You can rearrange uh, the entire story. You can cut characters. You can cut lines. You can cut entire roles. You can cut entire scenes. You can't really add anything, right? Um, but you can change the context completely. Completely. So I think life is similar, except all those three, those three things are happening simultaneously. We came in with a script for our lives. A general blueprint of how life is going to go. I don't think it's random where we're born, how we're born, who we're born with, what we're doing, where we are, what we know, what our talents are, or whatnot. I don't think it's coincidence. I think there's something more at play beyond that. But as you're living life, you have to direct. You have to direct your life. You have to direct where you're going. You have to direct how you're doing. You direct, you direct who you know, how you know, how you do your relationships, you have to direct what you, what you do, who you are, right? You have to direct life. That's how you live. You direct it. But also at the same time, editing is happening because we have a mind. We have an ego that processes all this information, makes judgments, makes opinions, makes positions, makes uh, traumas, makes moments of joy, 
It's all this. Because if you take off the mind, the ego, you take it off. Life is just life. Stop thinking for a moment if you do that. It's, a lot, it's easy when you like watching a sunset, for example. If you stop thinking, it's just life. It's all unfolding. It just is. There's no meaning behind the sunset necessarily. There's no meaning behind uh, uh, a beautiful smell from wine. There's no necessarily meaning with everything. We all impose the meaning on everything uh, with our minds, with our ego, with everything, right? We all make meaning out of everything. Um, it all is. So we're editing. So be an editor in your life too. So you can rearrange the events of the past. You can choose to recontextualize them. You can choose to cut things out and just kind of forget them. You can choose to edit your life. And all those are happening simultaneously. So is it destiny or is it free will? As I mentioned, something else beyond that. That's my, my thought of it. <laughs> it's something else. Wow. I'm just amazed by this meal. Doreen says, you need a significant other. You're a catch. Thank you so much, Doreen. I appreciate that. Thank you. As Han Solo is famous for saying, I know. <laughs> hey, Sil says, it's so nice to catch your live video. Uh, you're so right. Living in the present is the best. Yeah. Uh, do you have any ideas of near-death experiences? Yeah, it's very fascinating. The more you read about near-death experiences, the more interesting. They all have the same story. I mean, not all. I'm, of course, I'm exaggerating, but there's an overwhelming percentage. And people have studied statistically what the percentage is. You can read out about it. There's many books on it. I actually met someone at a party once that researches this. They call it NDEs for short. Uh, an overwhelming percentage, higher than what would be considered error, error, so higher than 50%, higher than chance, describe very similar things in a near-death experience. Why? Well, we're not sure. Miss Love says out-of-body. Yeah, you know, there's a differentiation between near-death and out-of-body. Yeah, there's studies that talk about the difference also between the two. But I can tell you an experience I had. Um, when I was like, I was about 21, 21. Uh, I went to the beach with my friends to Far Rockaway Beach. And hopefully this won't turn you off from Far Rockaway, but be safe in Far Rockaway. It's a really great beach, but it's also a bit dangerous. So we are uh, hanging out, going to the beach, enjoying our time. It was a huge group of friends, about 20 people, more. I think it was about almost 30 people. And, um, and, there, and it was a pretty nice day, but the winds were picking up and suddenly a riptide pull, pushed about three of my friends away, along with myself, a riptide. A riptide, if you don't know, it's kind of a tide that rolls in on itself. I don't know exactly how to describe the dynamics, but the problem with the riptide is that it kind of rolls on itself. And you're kind of pulled out. So no matter how sh strong you are of a swimmer, you can be Michael Phelps. If you're caught up in the riptide, a riptide can take you far out to sea, no matter how strong you're swimming in the opposite direction. It's really difficult, really, really difficult to swim out of a riptide. It's very dangerous. And their prevalence in Far Walk Away. And people die every year because of the riptide. It's, it's very sad. So uh, a few, many of my friends saw the riptide coming and I remember I was, uh, we were enjoying, I was about at five, five, five feet of water, I'm like up to here, uh, maybe a little bit more. It was, the water was getting up to my mouth. 
a lot of my shorter friends, uh, most of them were the, the female friends in the group, uh, who were like 5'2", 5'3", 5'4", uh, they were already going back to shore once the water level started going up. And we were just, and, mo and the rest of it was just uh, uh, three of my guy friends. We were there. And as we saw, we saw the, the female friends move away and they were like, <laughs> they were like wavy, like, <laughs> like, bye, uh, it's getting too crazy. And they were like, oh, don't worry, cause keep, keep, come back in. And the water came up, 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 and I could barely feel my feet touching the ground. And I was like, uh oh. I didn't know about riptides, so I didn't know too much about what was happening, but I knew I was getting in too deep. So the water was hitting up right there. I don't know how to swim. I don't know how to float. And I was right beside a friend of mine who actually watches this show. Um, so shout out to him. I'm not sure if he wants me to say his name, but he's a very kind friend of mine. He's right next to me. And one friend is a very good swimmer. So he started swimming. He started struggling. That one friend actually ended up getting through the riptide. He knew how to get out of riptide. He swam, uh, which is parallel to the beach. He swam parallel to the beach. He ended up uh, escaping the riptide. He was a very knowledgeable friend. I think he was a lifeguard. That's why. Yeah, he was a lifeguard. He, he's a very talented filmmaker, too. And then the other friend, who's a good swimmer, but he's not a lifeguard. He doesn't know too much about the dynamics of riptides. He swam but he was getting deeper as well. And my friend that I was next to, he was not a strong swimmer. I think he knew how to float. I think he knew somewhat how to swim. I didn't know either, but he was panicking naturally. And he said that he got caught up in some type of rock on the sea floor. I'm not sure what happened, but he felt like he was trapped, so he couldn't get up and he was really panicking. And that was a very scary moment because um, people die every year from riptides, every single year. Um, I could have easily been on the brink of death. Easily. I could have easily drowned. My friend felt like he was drowning uh, because the water was already here, so I was kind of grasping for air. And he couldn't, so his head was submerged below the water. And I tried, I was pulling him up. And you know what happened at that moment? It would have been very easy for me to succumb to the fear. but I felt an overwhelming sense of peace. I don't know why. I felt like I needed to be there with my friend. I just felt like I needed to be there for my friend. Um, I don't want to make myself to be a hero because I didn't save him. Uh, he, they're all alive, so <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry, they're all alive. Uh, but I wasn't the one who saved him, but I felt like I just needed to be there with him. Um, so I pulled him up and I tried to just calm him down. And uh, the water was hitting over and over until my head was submerged. And I just felt peaceful. I, I felt like, yeah, I didn't feel anything. I, I, it's not that I didn't feel anything, I just felt peace. I just felt at peace. And luckily, as I was grasping for air, um, and I felt uh, I was holding my friend, trying to kind of calm him down as the water just kept going above our heads. We saw <laughs> a huge group of lifeguards come. It was about 12, 15 lifeguards for me and my friend. And like four or five lifeguards went over to, to my other friend who was a good swimmer, but he just couldn't get out. Um, and the guy just came and one stayed with us. He was like, it's okay, it's okay. And I remember him trying to tell me it's okay. And I, I was like, no, no. <laughs> I was like, my friend, he's like, I'm okay. I wasn't okay. I don't know how to swim or, or, or float. I wasn't okay. But I just felt like he needed to be with him uh, and save him first. Um, 
I don't know why I felt so peaceful. I felt so relaxed. It wasn't like a, a death wish or anything. It wasn't in a negative way. And by no means, I just felt at peace. I just felt relaxed. And I was saved. We were saved by that huge group of lifeguards. Thank you to the lifeguards. Who knows what would happen? I could have, you know, I, I think one intellectually, one way I felt at peace was... I knew inherently that the world will take care of me. If it's my time to go, it was my time to go. But if it wasn't my time to go, people have survived riptides before. They may have lost consciousness <laughs> and floated back shore. It has happened. And I felt like if, if that's the case, I'll survive this. If, if that's not the case, at least I was there with my friend for those final moments. Yeah. So that was my near-death... You know, I didn't have a near-death experience per se, but that was my uh, brink with death. I'm not sure why. Anyway. Uh, very close touch with death. Me and my friends had a good time that night. We were all joking around, dramatizing the event. We added sharks to it. And again, we were hanging out with a huge group of people. So we, were, we all shared this experience together. And we had a, like a party at one of my friend's house. And, and we just started dramatizing the event beyond to, to just extreme, uh, extreme levels. Uh, we found out that that one friend who's a good swimmer and a lifeguard... He said that he was able to hail the, the lifeguard. So we were thankful that he was able to do that. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, Kathy says your guardian angel helped. Yeah. I survived something as well that kills most people, says Kay. Ooh, I'm curious if you want to share. You're a good human soul, says Tika. Oh, Tika, thank you so much for the compliment. Uh, did Baywatch come to the rescue? They did have the red thing, the red Bowie. I'm not sure what it's called. They had that. Yeah, they had the red thing. Uh, that was really cool. So yeah, yeah, they did kind of look like Baywatch. Joe says, what beach was that? Far Rockaway Beach. And you know what? Afterwards, I did keep going back to Far Rockaway. I was much more aware of riptides. That's for sure. Yeah, my friends are, were as well. And we only went when there was lifeguards. So we, I think we tried one day and there was no lifeguards. So most of us did not go into the beach afterwards. But yeah, we continued going to the beach. There was no, luckily there was no trauma no trauma whatsoever. I don't think any trauma with my friends at all. Um, you know, it was a scary event, but that was that. Have you learned how to swim? No, I've not learned how to swim. And no, that's not the reason I don't go to beaches too often. It's just that. <laughs> Unless if I'm with friends or hanging out at a, a sandy beach, I don't like going to the beach too much. Are you a champion swimmer now, says Ludo? No. Meal so good. Mm. Use herbs de Provence, ladies and gentlemen. Herbs of Provence. Use it on your steak. Oh my God! It brings the steak to another level. Not had a good uh, a meal this amazing um, in a few days because <laughs> I had an amazing meal a few days ago. Uh, Wendy says I can't swim. Oh no. Anne says, this is much more interesting than the average Friday night TV shows. I think a pint of Kilkenny cream ale, excuse me, would be great company while oh, watching this. Uh, I have survived a bad car crash, Guardian Angel. Yeah. Uh, Cat Stevens caught in the riptide as well in California. Oh, he did, yeah. He, he survived, right? Yeah. John says, 
please share the recipe for Herbs of Provence. Herbs of Provence, you're better off just buy, buying it as a as already a spice mix. Um, Ludo says, watch out, don't burn your mouth on that steak. I, it, the steak is already cold. <laughs> this steak cooled down quickly. So yeah, this has to be served as fast as possible. Erebus says, how old were you? I was about 21 years old. 21. Theragon is good on steak too, says Lauren. Oh, cool. Do you find a more laid back style in terms of people not locking up their doors and windows open unlike they do in the US? Yeah. Yeah. Here, people do lock up um, doors. So it's not as kind of carefree maybe as like Netherlands was or Denmark, but uh, yeah, people leave their windows open. It seems more carefree. I definitely feel more relaxed and I don't, and I've noticed people on the street are not as anxious. I'm a big guy. I'm tall. I'm, I'm a big guy also. I'm just a bit heavier. So, um... I'm a larger build, so if in the U.S. I've noticed that people, especially late at night, people are a bit more wary if I'm like walking behind them. I've noticed that. It's so clear. It happens with women uh, specifically, but also happens with some uh, um, certain other uh, people as well. And it, it, it's a bit uncomfortable on my end because obviously... Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> I come in peace. But it is awkward. It is very awkward. I, I feel the anxiety when I'm in, um, in New York City. I, like, I feel the anxiety. So I'm very cautious and not walking too close to someone at night behind them. Uh, because I know that some people really feel freaked out. I can feel it. They keep looking behind their shoulder. They're walking a bit faster. It's weird. Uh, and I get it. I get it. I get it. Uh, so it's understandable. Uh, but here, it barely happens. It barely happens. I have not found myself in the scenario where I feel like someone's getting freaked out because I'm walking at night <laughs> behind them. Uh, not following them. I'm just like casually just walking in the same direction. I have not felt that happen in many parts of Europe. Almost nowhere. Yeah. Not England. Not Ireland. Not... Not France, not Italy, uh, not Scandinavia for sure. Scandinavia, not at all. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know why. Maybe that's a more, more American thing. I'm not sure. Mexico. I remember Mexico. Not so much. Mexico either. Not so much. Puerto Rico does happen. Hmm. Brett says, are you a really religious man? No, but I am very spiritual. No, I'm not religious. Religious, um, I deeply love uh, the Catholic faith and, and many other faiths around the world. They all have so, much, so many amazing lessons and amazing teachings and amazing aspects and amazing lore. Oh, wait up. YouTube started playing a commercial. They all have amazing, yeah, amazing uh, aspects to all these religions. I love them. Only downside of religion is that it's, it's a bit dogmatic. You have to... I get why that's the case. It is good for some people. I just don't feel like I would need to do a ritual every single week. Uh, or something like that. Or adhere to some type of dietary restriction. Or... Yeah, things like that. I don't feel like I have to do either. So I wouldn't consider myself religious in that respect. I understand why people do it. And it is a positive force in the world. No matter how people like to uh, really 
really uh, tarnish religions. They've done more good than bad in the world. Uh, yeah, uh, people do talk about the terrible things that has happened in religions, and there's some very heinous things. But it has been a positive force upon the world, and we have to remember that it's, it's a bit difficult sometimes. As I mentioned, it's difficult to love. It's difficult to love. Because when we're faced with what we deem as evil, and when we're faced with what we deem as bad and as horrendous, we tend to only see that. We tend to only see that. We tend to focus on that. We tend to keep talking about it. We tend to keep making more movies, and more videos, and more documentaries, and more uh, books upon those negative events that have happened throughout history. We keep going with that further and further and further more. But sometimes you have to be faced with the reality that there has been very positive things that have come out through all of history with religion, with, with certain wars. Po positive things have come out with the way people have um, handled conflicts. We tend to see the past as from our lens of a world that, at least in the West and parts of the East Asia, is relatively peaceful. We see, our, we see our past from this lens. But it's like you, high on a mountain, looking at the guy at ground level and thinking, how could this guy not see a, the amazing view? How can he not see the view? It's a great view. And you might see that individual down there lost. And you're like, dude, is this, you just go that way. Just go that way. It's around this hill. What are you doing? Why are you lost? Why are you lost? But they're not lost. They're just down below a lower elevation than you are. You're able to see everything from high above. And that's where we are in history. We've climbed the mountain and we're looking at history as if they're all barbarians and vicious, terrible people. But people were, they were at that moment in history for, for because they didn't know any better for many reasons. So, um, so yeah, it's important to be aware when making any judgment upon people throughout history. Be very aware about that fact that you can claim a moral superiority of many, many generations of people throughout history, kingdoms, religions, uh, belief systems. You can really, really make a lot of moral you could really feel morally superior, but beware, beware, because we're only moral su morally superior because we've gone through that. We have, as a humanity overall, of course, uh, we've gone through all those hardships over those tough times. We've all gone through it and pushed forward and gone to a place where we're all right now. Susie says, we're all a bit traumatized now. <laughs> oh, sorry to laugh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, world, uh, the world can be crazy, but yeah. <laughs> it's hard to say anything that would make anyone feel better. It's hard. It's hard. You can't truly ever say anything. That would, that's, that's the problem with a lot of people who tend to be speakers about these topics philosophical, uh, religious, spiritual, political. It's the tricky part is you can't ever say anything that will make everyone feel better. There's no way. You can say actually a lot of things that one could say will make someone feel really shitty. Of course, there's people out there that say a lot of things that make a lot of people shitty, but no matter how great of a figure you are, no matter how wise you are, there's always the chance that you'll say something that will make someone out there or a group of people out there feel shitty. So you have to remember that. 
take that into account. So yeah, there's nothing I can say about the the state of the world. All I can say from my point of view, it's it's better to turn off the news. Turn off the news. Turn off the news. Because if you turn off the news right now at this very moment in time and don't watch news for a few weeks, what's the worst that can happen? Let me know what's the absolute worst thing that can happen if you turn off the news. Not much. You might... You... A conversation with friends? They're not gonna... They're, you're not gonna be able to discuss what happened in some part of the world? Lauren says you won't know the weather. Well, well yeah. Yeah, you won't know the weather. It's probably the worst that could happen is you won't know the weather, especially if you're a farmer. You're not going to know what the weather is. You're not going to know. That's it. That's it. That's the worst thing that could happen. Uh, the news ain't going to save you from anything. Literally, it's not going to save you from anything. Uh, the news will not save you from anything. It won't make you informed in a way that will better your life really in any way. It will just make you informed. That's it. But you can be informed about the worst qualities of humanity. You don't need the news for that. You can really go into the depths of the hellish realities upon this world if you wanted to. It's online. I luckily have never gone that deep, but I know it did exist. You can go into that level. Would you go? You wouldn't, right? Most people wouldn't. Most people watching the show would never go into those realms of the internet that are really dark. They would not. I would not bother looking at that. Um, so why watch the news? A lot of the news is negative. So just turn it off. Just turn it off. Three says it, it, it will come when it comes time to vote. Do you need the news to tell you how to vote also? Can you just read up about the candidates directly? Can you see their own words directly? Luckily online you can nowadays. You don't need necessarily the news for, to be informed about political uh, candidates. You can read about them directly. They have all talks and, and videos on their own channels from both sides. You can make a decision even without watching the news. So yeah. Uh, Lauren says, why is it negative? The news is built in a way to maximize viewership. And the way you can maximize viewership is to uh, make people feel anxious, fearful. It gets people hooked. If you generally tell someone a good, news, a good story, they might listen and then they'll turn off the TV. You're not going to get hooked. That's why when I tell a story, I know the the juicy bits are the dramatic parts, the, the, the suspense, the, the scandal, the, the, the tragedy. Those are the juicy bits that get people hooked on any story, any story, maybe film, books, TV, news, lecture, anything. That, that's what gets you hooked, is those bits that dwell in the negativity because if you tell someone a purely happy story, once you tell it to them, that's it. They're done. They're done for the day. They're, they got a good happy story. That's it. They're not going to really care to <laughs> go any deeper with anything. Um, so unfortunately, the news is built generally around the world. It's built to be pretty negative. Some places a little bit more than others. In America, it's a bit more driven by ads than it is in, uh, in the UK, for example. Problem is, in the UK, it's run by a government. So the government also has their own agenda. So, so yeah, I would say if you are really nervous and feel really anxious about what's happening in the world, I'm going to tell you bluntly, 
turn off the news on TV, on social media, turn it off, stop watching. Because unfortunately your anxiety, your fear, your trepidation, whatever you want to call it, is not going to help that person halfway across the world going through starvation, war, hunger, disease. Abuse, oppression, it's not going to help them. Maybe doing something proactive will, yeah. Sometimes being too proactive also can harm someone. So you got to watch out with that too. But yeah, your fear, your anxiety is not going to help someone. Your sympathy, your pity, it's not going to help anyone. You can be a decent human being and feel for anyone who's going through hardship. But remember, feeling bad is not going to help anyone. Live your life. You have a life. And if mo most people watching here are living in places that are relatively peaceful. We have a few viewers from the Ukraine, so hopefully you'll feel better. Hopefully you can go somewhere else, potentially. Or hopefully your home will become more peaceful again. Uh, but for most of the other people tuning in, you're living in relatively peaceful places. You might say New York City is dangerous. Try comparing it with other parts of the world. It's dangerous also to play that game of comparison, but sometimes you need, you need that comparison. Compare it to other parts of history, points of history. Don't take for granted New York City, Texas, Canada, France, Italy, England, Scotland, Ireland, Norway, Denmark, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. Don't take it for granted. Some of them are uh, out of that list. Some of them are a little bit more dangerous than others. Still don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. All right, I got a few more bites. Let me know if you want to see the final two courses. I can have just a little bite of what I intended to have the next course because yeah, you'll see why. Mm. Wow. I did not have time to eat the salad. But. Susie says, I was trying to counter argue with you. <laughs> I'll, re I'll read Susie's comment. Let's see. News is not all news. Oh, of course, Susie. Yeah, of course. Um, that's 100% the case, but be aware that I 100% know what you mean, but... A lot of news... They might show you a, a nice human interest story, but right next to that human interest story, let's say um, on the nightly news, this happens in America. They might talk about a little kid in some school in some far off place in New York City, won a science prize and did something awesome. They'll show you that story and then as they're cutting to commercials, they'll say, four people got murdered in so-and-so neighborhood. Stay tuned to learn the rest. Immediately. This happens many parts of the world. You might have that beautiful human interest piece, but it'll be immediately next to, or intertwined sometimes, with a very negative story. So, I think, yes, it is possible to see very positive news. You just got to be very discerning of who you're reading or what you're watching. Uh, and yeah, there are news stations out there that really stick to the positives. I don't know too many. <laughs> I don't think I... Oh. I, I follow movie news, so I really like uh, John Campia, for example, on YouTube. 
he's amazing. But he talks about movie news, and most of movie news tends to be fairly positive. There are some kind of bummer stories sometimes, but generally it's mostly positive. So I watch him. I watch movie news. I watch um, sometimes some BBC segments. You can be selective on YouTube. You don't need to watch all of BBC, but there are some BBC segments where you um, watch and, you know, it's just a nice story about a tiny little town in England doing something. They're gardening well. You know, that happens in the, the BBC, but at least on YouTube, you can click on just that story. But on TV, you, you can't. TV is just going to play the next thing. All right. Wow. That was so good. So is the news on TV with commercials? Yeah, in, in the US, yeah. News has commercials in the US. And you can watch documentaries. Right, Pistol, you can watch documentaries. If you want to be informed about the beautiful things about the world, there are so many beautiful documentaries. I highly recommend them. Okay, let me know if you want to join me for two more things. Oh. All right, back to the kitchen. A lot of people are saying yes, please. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Dessert is... No, I'm joking. This is not dessert. I, I eat this usually for breakfast. Um, so here in France, usually you can either have one dessert or two desserts. If you have two desserts, usually it's this, or you have one or the other. This is usually the case in France. So in France, sometimes when you order dessert, it'll be cheese. And we have two cheeses. We have a Comte cheese from this region and we have, um, ooh, a very, very fragrant. Wow. Oh, my God. Ooh, that's super fragrant. Uh, Croton de Chavagnol. Chavagnol. So, uh, goat cheese. Look at that goatee on that goat. Ooh, whoa. That's funky. Oh my god, that is... Don't, don't eat that on a date. Oh my god. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, don't eat that on a date. Kay says, dessert for me is something sweet. Yeah, I'm only going to have a small piece of this because, yep, I have actual dessert. So I'm just going to have a small piece of Comte. And let me uh, cut up a piece of this. Whew. Damn. This was a funky goat. Wow. Look at that. Damn. Damn, this goat. Wow. Ooh. This goat needs some Axe body spray. We're going to combine it with Oh, this is very good. Oh, this is very good. France uh, equals dessert cheese. Yeah, yeah, cheese, cheese is uh, cheese is sometimes dessert in France. <laughs> Jan says, if your date does not like cheese, you don't need that kind of negativity in your life. Touche, touche. Who cut the cheese? I think someone definitely cut the cheese. We have a nice black cherry jam, which I already ate some. A black cherry jam. How many people do I have tuning in? Oh wow, we have 200 people tuning in. I'm so glad. 
I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try One Piece with jam, and One Piece without jam. And then, this comp cheese is really good, but I'm gonna try with jam because it's, oh, it's falling apart, or it's melting. I left it out for quite a while. Uh oh, it is already melting. Mika says, in Sweden, we have uh, cheese before the sweet dessert. Yeah. So let's try the compte. Mmm. Wow. Wendy says, are you going to share? <laughs> You're bringing all, all the good stuff, says Jen. Yeah. So this is why I spend a bit more money. is because of the cheeses. Uh, I went to the cheese shop, the Fromagerie, which means a cheese shop. Got the jam, got that cheese compte, which I got a big, uh, the serving is a bit too big. Uh, I won't be able to finish it, I think, uh, for the weekend, but I can take it back to my next place. Uh, two cheeses, and I also got the wine. I ended up being charged 30 euro for that. Um, yeah, and I think it's because of the jam. Jam probably is already 10 euro. Wow, that's really good. It does need some bread though, but I'm gonna skip the bread because it's gonna get too full. So let's try the cheese. Will you eat the cheese rind? Let me know. It does look good. Oh. Mmm. Wow. Oh my god. I'm getting notes of of a sweaty gym. Wet socks. Fresh fart in the lavender field. And you're catching a whiff of it as the breeze passes by. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually a good cheese. <laughs> oh wow, that was a good cheese. I'm gonna try it with a little bit of honey. So I also got provincial honey, which I use for other things. So this is honey from Provence. I'm just gonna have a bite of that as I'm still biting on this cheese. Right here. Yeah, combines better, yeah. Yeah, it's better with honey. But let me try it with jam. Yeah, way better with honey. All right, I'm gonna try the goat cheese with jam. Wow. Wow, this is a black cherry jam. And uh, this area, well, Mont Montan a little bit more, but this area is known for jams as well. Because the English brought that culture of jam here. That is really good. The jam cuts through, uh, the cheese cuts through the jam, but just enough for it to meld together into a beautiful, funky, fruity concoction. A little bit of funk, a little bit of fruit. It's all nice. That is a very good combination. Oh yeah. Get down tonight with that type of jam and cheese. Wow. My jam to that cheese and jam. Mmm, that's good. All right, I think that's enough cheese. I've had enough cheese to feed a small village. I am cheesed out. And luckily I'm not burning red 
This is a miracle, ladies and gentlemen. A miracle. I'm not burning red. I'm not sure how this is possible. Well, I do know why it's possible. Because it's good quality cheese. They use great quality cheese in this Dauphin. If I were to eat this potato, which we were seeing only the remains, and the cheese souffle, if I were to eat in all these type of dishes in America, ladies and gentlemen, I couldn't do this live video. I couldn't. I, I, I would just be, I would just be a, a red, bloated mess. Like, I'm exaggerating a little bit. I won't be too, too terrible, but I'll be very red. And, and it just wouldn't be nice. Oh my God. All right, I'm never going back. That's it, that's it. All right, I'm gonna move here. I'm gonna call the, the owner of the Airbnb, ask him if I can rent it out for life. <laughs> let me, let me know. Uh, Pistol says there's also chemicals. Yeah, unfortunately in the US they use chemicals and they use um, antibiotics and things like that with the uh, cheeses, which is such a shame, such a shame. George says tonight's live, uh, live stream has been uh, sponsored by Cheese Whiz. Me, uh, K sent 500 stars. Thank you so much, K. Ashton sent a thousand stars for the previous live broadcast. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to need a little bit more wine. I'm going to need the dessert. Let me know if you want me to stick out, stick around for more time as we eat a sweet dessert, a little bit more wine, a little bit more sparkling water, and you can ask me more questions. Um, so let me know if you want to do that. I gotta put this cheese back in the fridge. I'm gonna enjoy a good cheese board with some bread tomorrow. And yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. I also bought, I bought other things. I could probably take this one home. I haven't opened it yet. 100% pure hazelnut butter. No oil, no salt, pure hazelnut. So excited. The bottle of wine is not empty, says uh, <laughs> Nicole, yeah. Let's uh, put out the fireplace, says Ludo. I think we shall. some cleanup. So I also bought Zatar, 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 that's how you say it, Zatar. Um, really good, really good Zatar. Uh, this is a uh, Lebanese, but it's made with French herbs, so it's really done well. I have a little Turkish delight that some of the, the Lebanese that Thor gave me earlier. Got some chocolate made with, that I bought in Chamonix. Some cashews. And some mint tea, which I actually will need after this meal. But let's eat this. So I gotta plate this. So bear with me as I plate this and grab some more wine. He says, you can't finish yet. You've been, um, you've been, um, you haven't finished your wine. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I can reveal how tall I am. But you got to keep this a secret. You can't tell people. You can't tell people. I'm here in an apartment. There's high ceilings. I'm going to do a full body shot. You can't tell people how tall I am. Do you use the toaster, says Ludo? No, I have not used the toaster. There we go. I can reach. Look at that. That's how tall I am. <laughs> George says, please make me a sandwich. George. Don't say that in America because that means something very different. 
especially at night, don't tell your male friends to make you a sandwich and if you're heterosexual. Uh, don't tell your male friends. If you have no sexual intent with someone, don't tell them to make you a sandwich in America at night. Not a good idea. He says those are low units for someone who's probably three. Yes, of course, of course. All right. A lemon tart. And this time I'm gonna sit here. Someone asks, what does that mean in America? and I'll tell you. <laughs> that's, something, that's something you gotta search on your own. I think some things are a bit better unsaid. For some reason, YouTube keeps pausing. Doesn't YouTube want more views? Why do they? So for uh, American sexual innuendo, um, there is a, I got a, I gotta play. I gotta play the the music again. Um, Miss Love says, "Don't get a copyright thing." Yeah, yeah. In America, it is a a stereotype or kind of a joke that after a man and a woman have sex, um, the man says, "Okay, make me a sandwich." <laughs> If you're if you're foreign, you're probably like if you're not from America. Sorry, if you're not from America, you're probably like what what is that funny? No, oh. <laughs> that's the way it is. It has more meaning to it, but I don't know the full implications of why that even became a joke in the first place. But it's supposed to be the meal you eat after sex, rather than the cigarette. I think the cigarette is, is too European for Americans. So instead you have a sandwich. All right, time for a mega pint. Chris says, does it work? Will you get a sandwich? It does depend, it does depend. It really does depend. All right, let's try a lemon tart. This I got it at a nearby bakery. After I'm done with uh, my tour here, I'll, if you want, I can post the, well, from what I remember, the places I visited to buy these goods. But let's try a nice lemon tart. That is really good. Wow. Oh, wow. Wow, very, very strong natural lemon taste to it. No lemon extract here. This is, they squeezed that lemon, made it into a tart. Great cookie. It's gluten-free cookie too, so they made it with some other, I'm not sure how they made it gluten-free. It's very crunchy. Mmm. That's really good. Oh. Amazing. I can 
not put it too loud because neighbors. All right, feel free to ask me anything. Susie says, yuck, not sounding very tasty. Really? Really, you think so? I like it. Morgan says, corn and so wheat? No, it's not corn. Probably maybe, maybe almonds? It's a cookie. Yeah, maybe almonds. I'm not sure. Doesn't taste like almonds, so something else. Brett says it sounds like Al Bundy would say something to Peggy and would marry with children. I think that might be the or origin uh, origin of the joke. I think that might be. It, there's it definitely came from somewhere in American media. I think it might be actually married with children. So that's a astute observation. I love the Johnny Quest music in the background. Yeah, it's the Urbanist soundtrack, the original Urbanist. This is the Urbanist theme song. Although I have to eat desserts with a hot beverage to dissolve the sugary essence. Yeah, I do have tea, but I feel like having a little bit more wine. Do you get any royalties for the urbanist music? I do, yeah, I do. So I, I do have it copyrighted. All the music is copyrighted. So I own the copyright. If you want to use it, you will have to ask my permission. Um, and yeah, I do get royalties if anyone you know posts this on their own. I did have the unfortunate chance, when I released the, the, the album, Two different people stole my song. Two, they stole two different songs. And that's when I realized, oh, I gotta copyright this. And also I gotta put it, excuse me, on YouTube's copyright. And also TikTok's copyright. Because uh, yeah, I already had two songs stolen. Stolen and, and one of them actually started selling it on iTunes. So people are wondering, why don't I have my music on iTunes? That's why, unfortunately, someone claimed one of the songs as their own and started selling it on iTunes. And it, it's really difficult to even get iTunes to respond. Um, and then uh, the other song, luckily nothing, not much happened. I got a few videos. They took, they put copy, copyright takedown notices uh, with one or two videos that had the song on. It was, and I, when I saw that, I was like, it's my song. <laughs> I contested it, and luckily they did not contest it back. It would have been very unfortunate if they tried to do so. Um, so uh, that's when I copyrighted all my songs and put them on the YouTube and TikTok copyright system. So, yeah. If you, if you make your own music or you produce your own music, in my case I produced it, um, be, be very aware of that. People do steal music nowadays and try to claim it as their own. It's very unfortunate. Mm. George, thank you so much for tuning in. Appreciate you. All right, feel free to ask me anything. Your shirt blends in well with the uh, with the backdrop. Yeah, it does. It really does. So, oh, and also it's on Spotify. Yeah. So if you if you stream on Spotify, do I earn a bit? Yeah, I earn money from all Spotify listens. I was, I'm counting on one of the songs going viral out of nowhere so I can make a living, a uh, small portion of a living from, from my music. Evan says, do you have any real estate investments in the U.S. or abroad? I, I only own a few properties in Monaco and and also in London, but uh, no, <laughs> no, I'm joking. I, I no, no, I'm not a real estate investor at the moment. I am not. I would like to. I don't. I wouldn't want to. I want to own buildings. Like I, 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 
I don't care for a house. I don't want to like run an Airbnb. I want to own a skyscraper. I'm serious. I want to own a skyscraper. Um, so that's when I'll be a real estate investor. Pretty funny says the ambitious. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I saw a YouTuber that showed some homes on the French Riviera and they rented out $16,000 a week. Says Chris, yeah, you can find some very expensive homes in the French R Riviera, but also there's cheap, you can, you can, parts of uh, many of these amazing cities like Nice, you can rent an apartment for 850 euro per month. Less than Manhattan, that's for sure. Gary says, would that be the Avengers skyscraper? Ah, uh, no, that would not be the Avengers skyscraper. Though I wouldn't mind having a, a, a building with the name Urbanist on it. I think that would be cool. Thoughts on flat earthers, says Evan. It's really hard to even consider flat earth if you've ever been on an airplane or on a mountain. It's really hard. The people who are into flat earth theory, or who, the people especially who genuinely believe it, they're doing some really, really strong intellectual acrobatics to get to that place. Very strong acrobatics, intellectual acrobatics. Really strong, yeah. That's that's impressive. I, you know what? I commend those people. I I gotta give it up to them. They're doing a good job, in somehow distorting reality so much to an extent that they, yeah, they believe that Earth is flat. That I think is pretty preposterous. But there are other theories like hollow Earth. Now that's interesting. That's interesting. That's where things can get a little bit more interesting when you start researching them. Almost says they're all wind up merchants. Yeah, I have no doubt that there are people out there that argue for flat earth because they want to argue truth. That's, that's, yeah. That's, that's the aim for a portion, if not the majority of people who are into flat earth, is that they want to argue truth and reality itself. And by arguing those things, it's a concept called sophistry, where you argue for the sake of argument. And when you argue for the sake of argument, it derails a whole lot of things. It's a very dangerous path, very dangerous path. So you got, I think, uh, as, a, as a society, especially where we live, many parts of the West, East Asia, um, many parts of the world are, are in societies where we really value intellectual discourse on the whole, on the societal whole. Um, we have to really watch out for sophistry when people want to argue for the sake of arguing. It's, it's a dangerous path that can lead to, it could lead to very nasty things. It could, you know, um, there's certain thinkers out there that say it could lead to the most heinous crimes of humanity if let, uh, if you let it out of control. It could lead to terrible things like happened in World War II. Uh, the, moon, the moon landing was real, says Evan. Uh, we're going back to the moon in the near future. Yeah, that's so interesting. We're going back to the moon. There's barely any news on that. So interesting. E. Rivas, thank you so much for tuning in. How about man on the moon then, says Wendy. I don't know. I don't know. That's a very good question. It is a very good question. I want to know the full behind the scenes of the moon landing. I would love to see that. I'm not sure if they actually really 
really documented it. And the hollow moon theory, says Ms. Lava, is interesting too. And basically any hollow planet theory is interesting. That's very interesting. I think it would be foolish to say that we know exactly what's in the center of the Earth. Uh, have we even scientifically proven it? I'm not sure if we have. People like to say that we know things scientifically, but you have to remember that science is not just empirical data, but science is also built on theories. Theories that have followed a level of empirical data and of peer review, that meaning other people are judging whether that's valid or valid to think that or valid to suppose that. And, and, so, and also you have to follow certain rules of logic, of course. That's, what, that's why science is very important. But remember, not all science is actually hard, 100% verifiable facts. <laughs> There's a huge portions of science where they're agreed upon theories. Doesn't mean they're 100% verifiable yet, at least. But that doesn't mean science is a bad thing. Science is a very good thing. Um... If you watch the ISS satellite, you'll see a UFO uh, speeding by says pistol. Interesting. Pablo says, anything you can share about your sibling? I would love to feature him on a video at some point. He's, he's a very, very fun person to be around. Um, my sibling is older than me. Uh, I was not raised with him uh, because he's a half sibling technically, um, but we're close. And I spent a lot of time in Puerto Rico. So when we did spend time together, which was a good portion of my childhood, um, I looked up to him because my sibling is very confident. Um, He's a very good people person. Very good people person. I've always been extroverted. Especially when I was very little. I was always, I was very, I was born very extroverted. But I wouldn't say I was born a people person. <laughs> I'm not necessarily a people person. Uh, not, at least not born that way, I don't think. I wasn't born... Uh, I don't think charismatic. Uh, I wasn't born uh, socially confident necessarily. Uh, and I really appreciate my brother because he is that. He is very charismatic, very charismatic. And I learned a lot from him in terms of charisma, which is very nice. Marco says he looked up to him because he was taller. No, he's technically not taller anymore. <laughs> I'm the taller one. <laughs> but yes, he was taller when I was younger. Uh, what age were you when you realized you loved to travel? Uh, Elizabeth says, I knew you were an extroverted child. Yes. So I, I'm going to answer your question. That's a great question about travel. Um, yeah, I was extroverted ever since I was... Um, when I was very little... When I was in kindergarten, I would hug all the kids, just hug them. Um, and yeah, I was just very affectionate with all the kids. And, and, um, and my parents would say when we would go to like museums, because my parents loved going to the museums. And when I was little, of course, they would take me with them. And I would, they tell me that as a baby, as an infant, in already walking, so maybe five years old or so, I would go up to other little kids and just chat with them. <laughs> Which is, is something even I don't even remember, but that's what they told me. It was like, you, you just like chatted. <laughs> you just went up to people and just chat with them. Um, and, and then you would look people at the eye, like if they were older, um, as a little kid, I would just have... As, and, be able to establish very good eye contact with, with anyone 
as a, as a child, as an infant. I would be very good at that. Uh, which, you know, uh, not every kid is good at that. Not every kid can handle really good eye contact. Um, so they noticed those extroverted qualities in me when I was little. So when it comes to travel, oh, and um, you might not have heard my dad speak in my videos, but my dad is also a very good storyteller. Very good storyteller. He loves making jokes. He's a very good joke teller too. Um, so I learned a lot of that from my dad as well. And then from my brother, I learned about the confidence and the charisma. Um, and my brother is similar to me in a way where Teacup mentioned earlier that I light up when I talk. I, re I really feel my element when I'm talking, when I'm chatting. Uh, my brother is like that. He also lights up when he talks. He has a glisten in his eye when he chats. Um, so when did I start getting the inkling for travel? In essence, I've been traveling frequently ever since I was a little kid because, um, because um, we, I would go to Puerto Rico about three times a year. So I am very much a person of two cultures. I simultaneously grew up both in Puerto Rico and in New York. So when I say I grew up in Jackson Heights, Queens, at least three out of those two, no more, at least four out of those 12 months, I was in Puerto Rico. So I grew, ever since I was a little kid, I would go back and forth between New York and Puerto Rico. And then uh, when I got a little bit older, um, especially Early out adolescence, my parents, we would go to like Disney World, we would go to Canada a lot, and we'd go to upstate New York, and we'd travel in Long Island, we would go all the way through New Jersey, uh, we would go Connecticut, I think we went, we went to Boston, and we went to Washington, D.C. So we would travel a lot in that northeast region of North America, a lot, uh, when I was a little kid. So I, I really got used to traveling, and then... Even, we grew up in Jackson, I uh, grew up in Jackson Heights, Queens, but we would go off to Manhattan, to Brooklyn, and we'd go to try different restaurants, go to different museums, so I got very accustomed of just enjoying culture as well. So that it was for a very little kid, but in um, sixth grade, I had an assignment that had to do with a partner to research about a culture, one specific country. Everyone can pick a country, but no one was allowed to pick the same country. So me and my friend end up getting Spain. And the teacher told us, okay, if, uh, for, anyone, for everyone doing this project, if you want to learn more about the country, uh, call up the embassy and ask them for information about the country. And she kind of gave us that uh, as an assignment. She told us to do that. So I called up Spain. I called up the embassy. And they sent me like, like these very thick brochures of all information about Spain. And I thought to myself, oh my God. I'm 12 years old. And I realized, wait a minute, I don't need to ask my parents to buy a book? <laughs> because obviously I, I'm not making money at 12 years old. Many people in, in, in Queens <laughs> are not making money at 12. Uh, so so uh, I couldn't just buy my own books at 12. I had to ask my parents to buy a book. And, we, and this was the age before YouTube and Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia came out just a, like two, a few years right after. So it was right before Wikipedia. And definitely many years before YouTube. So I couldn't just go online and see a documentary about whatever country. Uh, I only had a few websites. Uh, I used the CIA website. Lonely Planet was an old school website I used a lot uh, to read about countries. But when I realized I could get brochures from the embassies, I called up Finland. I called up England. I called up Italy, I called up 
uh, it was I called up like a random country in Eastern Europe. I think it was maybe Slovenia. I called up China. I remember I called up Japan, Mexico, Ecuador, Peru, <laughs> Dominican Republic. I called up so many embassies. I had like a huge stack of brochures that was taller than me at the age of twelve. Um, I remember my 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 mom was like. What are you doing? <laughs> she was like, like, don't you think this is a bit much? She wasn't. She she was very nice about it, but she she looked at me like, uh, isn't this a bit much? <laughs> and um, and yeah, I just read about all these countries, every single country I could. I read about it, and funnily enough, many years later, when I was um, twenty seventeen. I did that again. I started reaching out to tourism boards, not to get brochures, but to ask them for me for them to sponsor my trip over there, to invite me over. And and as I was doing that, as I was reaching out to all these countries, I ended up realizing, oh my, I already did this before. I did this when I was 12 years old. And the country that responded out of all of those was Finland. Finland responded. So that's why Finland, Helsinki was the first trip I did on Urbanist. Do you still have those brochures? I don't think so. I may have one or two, but I don't think so. I may maybe have one or two. Morgan says you're on the list for sure. Yeah, I do a lot of research about countries. So yeah, I have no doubt that if there's a list of people who are highly curious about the world, I might be on it, on the CIA. Uh, do you think, since you have been your own, on your own for so long, is it hard to find compromise? MK, that is a good question. That is a very good question. That is a very good question. I actually um, was thinking just about that. Excuse me. Uh, so, Ron, that's a great question as well. What's your personal highlight of Urbanist? Is, I'll answer this one quickly. I think the, the switch with me and Urbanist where I realized, oh wow, live video I've had many moments where I thought to myself, live video is very important. Many moments where I realized, wow, live video is super important. It's a very powerful medium. But where I really, really felt it was going through the canals of Mexico City. What was the name of the canals again? Chochimilco? I think it was called Chochimilco through the canals of Chochimilco. And that live video was very rocky. There was a lot of interference. I had streamed from like 480p in quality. Uh, but it worked. I end up doing Chochimilco. Thank you so much, Asami, for clarifying. I end up doing Chochimilco live. The canals in the south of Mexico City, canals that were hundreds of years old, uh, older than Venice, some of them, built by the ancient Aztecs. And we were live, and I was in front of a boat. We were accompanied by Yubish, the tour, the tour guide, really cool guy, his friend Fernanda, if you remember, and, um, and the, the, the guy that actually knew the canals, the guy who rode the boat, who was actually a really authentic. <laughs> Basically, that man has full Aztec blood. And that was so cool to do that live. And I was blown away when I realized, like, holy shit. Uh, you know, uh, Chochimilco has been covered in a lot of documentaries. A Ante Bourdain did Chochimilco on TV. But the fact that I was able to do it live 
I don't think there was any. I don't think there's any videos about Chochimilco live. Uh, there's not that many live videos in Mexico City. Period. Um, and that was awesome. And the fact that we we uh, end up going to one of the man-made islands in those canals that were farms, and they made us that f fresh huicholote. I think it was called huicholote or tlacolo. I forgot. The Mexico has very complicated names, but. Uh, we had that kind of amazing taco, and I asked the guy, and this was all live video, if you remember. Uh, let me know if you remember that, that, that live video experience. We were eating these uh, amazing kind of uh, fried corn tortillas with, with, uh, with, the, with the corn fungus and the spinach and the cheese. And I asked the guy, hey, um, where does the, because he told me that the corn was right there. Uh, so that already surprised me. It was like, oh, wow, we're eating really fresh corn. It's literally right there. Then I asked him, hey, uh, where does the spinach come from? And he just pointed. He was like, there. <laughs> it was like 20 feet away. He just pointed over there. Uh, so I was blown away that I was able to share that entire experience. That Anthony Bourdain covered, but it was all on live video. Which is, in, in my opinion, something differently special it's special for its own way compared to to uh to a tv show because you're there with me in essence uh virtually ariel the executive producer is tuning in 500 stars thank you so much for tuning in any special plans coming out with urbanist day laureen thank you so much for asking one thing I really don't like <laughs> is, uh, is putting pressure on anniversaries or, or special events. Yeah, this is a small little pet peeve of mine, is when someone wants me to plan something special, I don't like that pressure. I don't like it. But when I... When I don't have anyone at asking me to plan anything special, that's where I get creative. Uh, so, no. <laughs> Nothing special in mind thus far. Uh, that was a great stream, says Oleg. Oh, I'm so glad you think so, Oleg. I'm so glad you think so. Um, hello, Ariel. Nice to see you here. Because you did that live stream and I got curious I went to Chochimico this year, says Hisami. That's awesome, Hisami. Yeah, I remember you telling me you went to Mexico City that you did. Uh, you need to dance with Sanamarin, uh, Finland's PM. <laughs> she is close to my age. <laughs> she is close to my age. Uh, that is crazy to think uh, there's a prime minister who's is just a tad older than I am. Uh, I think if you really want to be with someone, you will compromise, says uh, Nicole. So someone earlier asked, um, being on your own for so long, do you have to, do you feel hard to compromise? So I've, I'm luckily, luckily very close with family. So I think once you really start opening up, being yourself around the people closest to you, like I am with my family and with certain friends as well. You don't need to compromise. What ends up happening instead is that you end up synergizing. But this is hard to do. You really got to be yourself with someone. And it gets easier over time. But the more you are open with who you are, what you like, what you prefer, what you like to joke about, what you like to talk about, what you like to eat, etc. If you're really open about who you are, really, and you have to know this within yourself, and that other person is doing the same, then I think it gets easier and you start synergizing. So you... Don't come into too many points where you have to compromise. 
were to like um, say, oh, all right, I won't do this because we, uh, because or right, we'll do that instead. I think compromising can be really dangerous if if you frame it as a compromise. Compromises are part of any life, any society, any moment in history. There's so many moments where one has to compromise. And I'm getting bitten by a mosquito. Uh-oh. I got put on the air conditioner. I don't want to be bitten by mosquitoes. Mosquito came in. So compromise is always very important, but I mean, uh, it always, it happens, it happens. Uh, but I think if you start framing compromise as a compromise, you end up getting into a tricky point where you feel like you sacrifice something. And while sacrifice might feel very noble, it's a shitty, feel, sh- shitty feeling sometimes, especially when you feel like you didn't need to sacrifice that thing. Because, yeah, there's, there's, I think there's the sacrifice with the little S and there's a sacrifice with the big S. The sacrifice with the big S is what people talk about when they talk about saints, sages, um, mythical figures, uh, classic tales about heroes. That's the big S sacrifice. But the small S sacrifice, when you feel like you didn't need to do it, it kind of sucks. It makes you feel shitty. Sometimes worse, it makes you feel like you resent So I think if you see a compromise as as being a compromise and you let it fester, it can be uh, a point of contention in the long term. So I would say it's better not to allow one in the relationship to do too many compromises and to focus more on synergizing. How can both of you, both parties or multiple parties, come to... Not just a compromise, but come to a synergy where everything, everyone's getting something that they really want. No sacrifices. We're all getting something that we want. I think that's the key. So is it is it easier or harder for me to do? Luckily, I've been having practice with friends and family. If I were to do in a relationship or with my own family, if I were to have kids. I think um, you know, I'll learn how to do it with them. Do you have a life philosophy? Love. Love as much as you can. MK says, wow, okay. Compromise is sacrifice. I would say you can frame it whatever way you want to, but it could be framed as sacrifice. So you got what I think I would say, watch out if you do. Ariel says, nice apartment. Oh, yes. Very nice apartment. So many windows. Yeah, yeah, it's a very open apartment. Yeah. Oleg says, mosquitoes. Yeah, unfortunately, mosquitoes. Yeah. It's, it's cool enough. I wouldn't need to close the windows, but I don't feel like getting bitten. So I'm just going to turn on the AC. Mosquitoes don't like air conditioner. Um, Once the surge is getting below 72 degrees Fahrenheit, mosquitoes don't tend to bite. So pro tip. Pro tip. If you're getting too too many mosquitoes and you have air conditioner, just turn on your air conditioner. Or turn on a fan. They can't fly too well with fans. Um, Joe says, where's the banana? Uh, it's in the kitchen. All right, everyone, let me know if you want me to stick around for, to round out three hours. We've been here for quite a while. I hope you've been enjoying this chat. Uh, a lot of people have asked questions. If, you, if I haven't answered your question, feel free to ask again. Um, we've been here a while, so let me know if you want me to round out to three hours, which is 22 minutes. Yeah, 22 minutes. Let's have one more glass of wine. All right, right here. 
Uh, Susie just asked one. Ask again, Susie. Let me know. Sometimes um, not every comment pops up. Oh, Susie says, um, <laughs> Be Good says, how's your love life? I don't kiss and tell. Uh, be, be good. Um, Susie says, uh, yesterday I said that I feel disconnected from New York. Uh, why is that? So Susie put a, a amazing, so Susie is posting on Urbanists of the World group page. Highly recommend going to Facebook if you want to chat with your other urbanists and share interesting articles, travel stories, photos, or screenshots from the live video broadcast, uh, go to Urbanists of the World travel page. Um, so, Susie posted an article about about influencers in New York City. And, and then uh, I post also another article about a phenomenon called Dimes Square in New York City. So in essence, New York City now is becoming a kind of a, a place where a lot of influencers and wannabe influencers, so there's people, if you don't know what influencer is, it's basically someone who has influence online. And a lot of them tend to be people who create content online. TikTokers, YouTubers, Instagrammers. There's influencers with millions of subscribers coming to New York, like Emma Chamberlain. If you don't know who she is, she's actually really good at making videos. I really like her, uh, but she's very interesting. She's, there's a good conversation just about her. Um, and then there's people who aspire to be an influencer coming to New York. So all these people are flocking towards New York City. And the thing is, especially, especially while scrolling through TikTok or watching any YouTube vlog, just like what happened after Casey Neistat got popular and there was a lot of people copying Casey Neistat in New York, you start seeing really the same things over and over and over again, people covering the same restaurants. There starts, there, there's a certain memification uh, memes are basically uh, ideas that self-replicate very quickly. A meme could be an image. People usually use that word for an image. Uh, but a meme means something that a uh, self-replicating idea. Like a virus. <laughs> but it's ideas. Uh, this is happening with New York things. Everyone's going to the same restaurant now in New York. There's like a restaurant called Lucien. Everyone's going to Lucien. At least it appears that way, because all the influencers are covering this restaurant called Lucien. Uh, everyone's having a cocktail at Dante's, which is another restaurant in New York City. So, uh, so there, uh, there's also a phenomenon called Dimes Square. Dimes Square is, instead of Times Square, it's a new area where the most ardent Influencers, the ones who either really want to make it big or already are already big, are flocking to a specific area in Lower Manhattan, which is uh, the parts of East Village, parts of Lower East Side, parts of Nolita and Soho. That's Dime Square. Parts of actually all the village. That's generally Dime Square. It's like that area of New York City that they call Dime Square. And that's the area also being covered the most by New York City influencers. So I uh, responded telling to Susie that I felt a little bit left out uh, from New York City. But specifically, I ended up realizing that it, uh, the statement was a bit too general because uh, I meant more specifically, I felt left out from that kind of influential culture in New York City. Nahid says, damn it, I missed the cooking. Yeah, you did. Yeah, the cooking was the first 45 minutes of the show. Uh, so you can watch it afterwards. Um, so I feel left out from that influencer culture. I used to go to influencer parties uh, back in 2017, 2018. I went to a lot of them. Nobu says, can you show us the sparkling water? Or 
Forreza. Forreza, really good sparkling water. So I used to go to a lot of influencer parties back in 2017, 2018, and they were really fun. They were genuinely people who, who like creating content, uh, who were doing it, a lot of them were doing it for fun, and some of them were entrepreneurs, but it was very clear that there were people doing it for a very good reason, fun and or business. And that was awesome. It was awesome meeting those people. Uh, I'll tell you some names. People like Brett Conti, Sam Sheffer, uh, Sarah Dietschy, though I didn't meet her directly. I w I, those were the parties. I actually didn't get to meet her uh, f directly, but I met a lot of the other people there. Um, Craig Adams. There was a lot of people. The, the, one of the guys who works with Casey Neistat, um, my friend Youssef, yeah, Jennifer O'Brien, you've seen, some of you have seen her vlogs. Yeah, I've met a lot of people in those parties. Um, Eric Conover was at those parties as well. So those guys, I, I could tell, especially in that, those early days, they were very genuinely either in it for the art and or for the business. But now I go, now I've been to a few influencer parties, and this time I won't tell you names. I will not tell you names. But I've been to influencer parties in the past year and no longer is it just about the arts, the slash fun, and or the business. It has, to me, become more of a praying ground for fame, virality, and making a quick buck. That's kind of the atmosphere feels like it is a little bit more now. And I'm not sure if it's just my perception or just the crowd I've been hanging out with, but that's, my, that's been my experience. And I don't, don't like it. And I can see this with my content about New York. I make a video about this little cool secret. For example, the windowless building. I was pretty much the first guy to make a video about that windowless building. There's, there's, a, there's a little mini documentary, but that was more artistic. It wasn't really a, a video about its history. I was the first guy to cover that windowless building on a video about its history and about the conspiracies associated with it. There's articles, of course, but I was the first guy to do it on video. Once I did it, uh, luckily the first time I did it, I was unnoticed was back in 2017 and and I was doing live videos on Facebook so you know no one noticed Did it all the way back in 2017 it was one of my highest viewed Facebook live videos I remember I ended up getting like 70,000 people tuning in for that live video about the windowless building and it was the first time I really told a story uh, on live video long form like a full story but then I covered it on TikTok and suddenly, there is some people who covered the same video, but I end up realizing they did it for good intentions. They covered it in different languages. You met one of those guys. He's a really cool guy. So I get why he ended up covering the same story and almost the same facts. But I get why he did it. He was just translating it. That's nice. There was another guy who also did it in Spanish. That's cool. But then I noticed a lot of people started covering the same story in English. Some of them do it with good intentions. I can tell where they're just... Uh, my friend, for example, John Freya here in New York, he adds a little bit more detail about specific things. He adds a little bit more detail about the architecture. It's kind of cool. Uh, but a lot of other people covering that same story are either copying the same thing I did or the same thing one of my other colleagues did and you can tell that they are not doing their due diligence. The video is not as tight as mine was. Um, and they kind of just seem to be covering it just because the sake it's, for the sake of that it's popular. 
And this has happened with a lot of my videos in New York where I cover a thing and there is dozens upon dozens or more of people covering the same exact thing. And no one owns history, so I don't feel bad. I don't feel pissed off or angry about that. I don't even feel pissed off or angry at all. Um, so it's not that. It's not that people are cop. It's not necessarily because I own anything. I don't own the story. And if someone copies exactly how the story is told, it kind of sucks because they are indeed copying in that case. But I don't own the story. I don't own the history. I don't own the analysis of the architecture. I don't own any of that. Uh, I don't even own the story itself, how it's told. But what I don't like is everyone's copying. It's a meme. And I get why people do it. But it kind of sucks when you copy something and don't add something more. Because I have done many stories on TikTok where I've, in essence, taken it almost directly from a, from a few sources online. You know, Atlas Obscura um, posting or an article. In the case with the windowless building, it was an article on a, I think a publication called The Interceptor, I think it was. I take an article written and convert it into a video. So I feel like I added something. Um, or if I cover something that already someone has made a video of, which has happened a few times, I tend to tie it in with another history. Another history. Or if it's more simple, I tend to just add my own spin on it, my own personal experience, a joke, add humor, whatever. I try to add something, you know, kind of not just a, do a straight copy because problem is when people start copying one after the other, one after the other, the more you clone, the lesser the quality. Quality degrades once you start cloning over and over and over and over. And that's why I see right now with influencers in New York, everyone's going to Lucien and Dante. And everyone's covering that windowless building, but no one's adding anything new. I'm, I'm, I'm using absolute terms, but of course it's not absolute. A lot of people are doing good work, but a majority of people are just copying. And it kind of sucks when you just copy. You just got to add something. So when, I meet those, when I've met those people in influencer parties, I won't say what the parties were or who the people were, but um, I, I, I did not feel any depth. It felt very vapid, very vapid. And I guess every scene, every artist goes through that period because this is nothing new. This happened to the artists of the 70s once the 80s started rolling in. This happened to the rock scene of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones once again those other bands started rolling in that would start copying them verbatim. Um, this happens, I think, with all artists. I think this probably happened with Picasso. <laughs> it's probably happened with, uh, with Rembrandt. Uh, it probably happened with many artists. Of course, I'm using great artists, but there's also artists that are not known or and, and, and of all qualities. But, and filmmakers, I bet this has happened to. So yeah, I think this is nothing new. But that's, that's, that's why I feel disconnected from that scene in New York. In, in, in a way, I kind of don't even want to make content about that type of New York anymore. You know, there's one restaurant that has gone viral called Via Carota. And they sell a pasta, they sell cachuy pepe, which is the simplest pasta. It's a really good pasta, but it's the simplest thing in, in Rome, a cachuy pepe. It's like six euro, seven euro maximum. They sell it for $27 at this place, Via Carota. And apparently it's very hard to get into. Uh, and I did a video on it back in December. I had no idea about this fame. I think this was shortly before I even became famous. Um, and uh, people were not copying me of that specifically, but I, I just walked in. I just came one night 
Like, uh, I was going to see a Broadway show. I wanted some Italian food. And I saw a, a place that seemed very vibrant. And I went inside and made a video. <laughs> so you can find a video of that place. And I was stunned to see it so viral now. And, you know, I wasn't impressed. This is, I enjoyed my meal. But I think in the video, I mentioned how expensive it was. And I think Action Kids tuning in. Hey, Action Kid, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, anonymous dude, thank you so much for tuning in. I, in the video, I, I, I noted that it was way too expensive. And now I see hordes of influencers in New York. What's a good word? Uh, they, they are jeweling at this place. They're, they think it's so good. <laughs> I was like, guys, come on, this is a this is overpriced Kachu Pepe. It's good, but you're spending a lot of money <laughs> for Kachu Pepe. MK says, I think uh, AK was feeling the same thing in New York, was oversaturated with streamers. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's another thing. Yeah, New York is oversaturated with streamers, but streamers are nowhere near as many. Streamers is a tiny percentage when you start comparing it to TikTokers. Oh my God, TikTok is a different phenomenon. So that was a very long answer to Susie's question. Susie, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for asking it. Anansu says, you're an artist. Same with AK. You guys are growing and maturing as artists and travelers. It's great for me to learn from. Oh, I'm so glad. That's good to hear. Yeah, everyone grow, grows dif differently too. It's interesting how we all cross paths. I am very grateful that I grew up in a city where you, you meet very interesting people. That's why I love cities. And I love New York because you really do meet interesting people. So it's kind of cool that I'm encountering people that probably be very well known years from now. And um, yeah, it's kind of cool. Like imagine being one of those artists that went to an Andy Warhol party in the 1970s, before he really became super famous. So early 70s, I think it was. Imagine going to one of those parties. Keith Haring was there. Basquiat, um, a, few, a few people who end up becoming major celebrities in movies, um, band members of like Velvet Underground, David Bowie, before he really became a super famous artist, hung out at one of Andy Warhol's parties. You were there and you thought that was, that was just the party of the cool people of New York. And... Imagine putting yourself in those shoes. You just went to a cool party of cool people in New York. That, that was it when, if you were there in the 1970s. Um, but 20 years later, there's some of the greatest artists and, and bands and actors and actresses and directors and filmmakers and superstars of the world in, in modern history. Uh, that's kind of crazy to think about. Uh, so who knows who's going to be the big stars of those parties that I went to that were hosted by Sarah Dietschy. Um, there are, some of them already have become, at least in YouTube, have become multi-million subscribed influencers. Like Eric Conover, I had the pleasure of very briefly saying hello to him. Uh, I'm more, um, yeah, Eric Conover, for example, has millions of subscribers. I got to know uh, Sam Sheffer a little bit better. Um, that man has like hundreds of thousands of subscribers. So it was really cool. So imagine what, what's going to happen 10 years from now. Some, s s someone, at least one person, if not a few people in that group, are going to be massive, um, well-known content creators or, or who knows what, 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 where their life will take them. But... Somehow, some of those people are going to be super well-known. I, I know it um, from my experience. That's why going to a, a city like New York is really cool. There's a, only a few cities in the world where you increase the chances of that happening. So if you have the chance 
to go to a party in New York or London or maybe Paris as well. Or nowadays, I would say in the East, maybe like a Shanghai, Seoul, or, or, or a Tokyo, go. <laughs> or Singapore. Um, or Latin America, Africa, there's probably a few places, Lagos, you know, uh, India. There's probably many other cities in the world where if you get to a cool party with a lot of cult people who are involved in the cultural arts, you're, you're going to meet some people who will become famous. Ludo says, are you still in contact with Action Kid? No. No. We don't talk anymore. We don't talk anymore. Action Kid and I, you know. I thought we were close. But then he left. He left me for Florida. I thought we were close. And he went to Florida. <laughs> I'm joking around. No, no, actually, because he's a really cool guy. Um, uh, I, I, he, we, we watch each other's show from time to time. Yeah, he tunes in from time to time. Uh, maybe we'll collaborate again uh, whenever I do decide to take that step and visit Florida. Once I take that step. It's a hard step. It's a big step, you know. I've, I've traveled to many places around the world. Well, not around the world, not too much, but around Europe and, and North America, but... Florida, that's the next big challenge. <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Um, but yeah, I can't, I can't wait to, to have Action Kids show me the ropes around Florida one day. You spend more time in Europe than New York City, says Nicole. Yeah, I have, yeah. I mean, read my, uh, the last... The last uh, qu question I answered explains why. I just feel like if I do any more New York content, I'm happy to work with a company and I might have the good fortune uh, and privilege to work with, with some really cool companies in New York soon. Bulova being one of them, Rise New York being the other one. But you gotta stay tuned for the third one. There's a one that's really cool. I'd be more than happy to make videos for them but when it comes to my own work, I don't know. I really got to get creative if I'm going to do more content about New York. I really got to push somehow, do something really interesting. I'm not sure what it is. It's really hard. Everyone's doing everything now in New York. Colleen says Action Kid tuned into the stream the other day. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he just commented today. Uh, Ida says, it's like launching the stone on the lake waters and they expand in circles. The first hit the surface. So it is life in the creative world. Oh, that's a good way of putting it. The ripples on the water from throwing the stone. Yeah. Uh, Susie says, your unique personality sets you apart from every, everyone else. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Susie. I appreciate that. Um, will you work with Louis Rossman in Austin, Texas? I, I, he's very interesting when it comes to real estate. Yeah, very interesting. I don't know too much about him. I'm very picky of who I collaborate with. I, that's why you don't see me collaborating with too many people. I'm very picky. I'm very, very picky. Um, one reason is I don't get along with everyone, um, naturally. I mean, this happens with any human, but... Um, I, what I don't really like is making a video with someone I find out I don't really get along with them. And it's happened a few times on, on camera. Um, not in a way where it's like, not in a way where it's like there's any harmful words exchanged or anything, you know, no fights. But I've been a few times on camera with, with people that 
I just really did not connect with. Or worse, they graded my gears. Um, and I, that's why now more and more I'm very discerning of who I collaborate with. But when I do collaborate with someone, it's magic. Oh, I like that. Yes, that's very nice. Very nice. Uh, Matt says, I heard travel chaos is going to be worse in fall and winter. Yeah, that's why I stick to Europe as long as I could because, um, yeah, airlines is kind of crazy. I, I've had a few friends that were going to come to Europe, but they decided not to. I had family as well. I have friends within Europe. I have one friend that was going to meet me at one of the cities I was going to visit, but uh, she had issues with airlines. So airlines is crazy. So I'm glad I avoided all that issue. <laughs> Ron says, we can tell you were uncomfortable with a few collabs. <laughs> there's, there's two or three out there, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think there's, there's one. I'll tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to tell you the, the, the name or where it was. But for the astute viewer, there was one. There was one. Where you, you, you see me. You see me at the height of my patience. Yeah. The height of my patience. It's the, 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 it's the only time on a live video where I really ran out of patience. Really. Really, it got close. It didn't, it didn't happen on video, but I got really close, running out of patience. Um, Colleen says, Action Kid tuned in on the other stream uh, the other day. I know, I know, Colleen. Thank you so much for tuning in, you yourself. Uh, Kay says, Olga, send 500 stars. Thank you so much, Olga. Airfare is through the roof, and worst of all, uh, people are paying those fares, so they're not coming back down. Oh, that sucks, Ryan. Yeah. Did you visit Germany? No, I didn't get the chance to visit Germany. I was close to doing a day trip to Germany from Netherlands, but I didn't get to do it. I wish, I kind of wish I would have done it. But at the same time, it was, it was going to be a long trip over there. Anasu says, thank you for sharing other travel, different channels that have great travels like Patrick Lopez. Patrick Lopez is awesome. I love that guy. Yeah, really cool content creator uh, based in, uh, he's Brazilian. Does really great content. Nicole says, it definitely happens when someone uses the mobile in your live stream. <laughs> uh, there has been, um, Nicole's saying, I, Nicole's referring to my pet peeve with people using a mobile phone when I'm hanging out with them, period. I, don't, I do not like when someone is on their phone when they're chatting with me. Uh, and I tell that people, I tell that to people straightforward in a polite, respectful way. It's like, hey, if we're gonna hang out together, don't be on your phone. I get if someone needs to check their phone maybe once or twice, that's okay. I get it if you have some type of business call, or some type of important phone call that you're waiting for, that's okay, or text, that's okay. But generally, I don't want to hang out with someone who's on their phone all the time. Um, that's a bit annoying. Uh, so, so, yeah, I generally I tell the, that to people straightforward when I'm with them. Um, but it has happened on, on a live stream once or twice. Where I had to tell the person, no, nah, again, not in the mean way. It was a very respectful way. But I told him very bluntly because it was on the show while live. I told him, hey, no phone. <laughs> and uh, one person, and they were very nice. This, uh, this instance, I remember the person was a very nice person. I did connect with them. But they were shocked when I told them that. They were like, <laughs> they kind of did not expect me to, to say that. Susie says, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, I, uh, actually, 
Yeah, I think I know who the person is. But yeah, that per very, there was a very good co collaboration I did, but I had to tell that person to not use their phone. It was a very nice collaboration. Um, Wendy says, Cliff, Cliff is awesome. Very cool guy. Uh, I think I saw that live stream, says Nicole. Yeah, yeah, that was quite a while ago, back ago. Uh, And Elizabeth says, you always pull out your phone, pull, pull away your phone uh, as etiquette with company. Yes. <laughs> Kay says, thank God it wasn't me. <laughs> All right, just have a little bit left. Wow, this was a long conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed dinner. I'm going to finish up this cup of wine. If you have any last remaining questions or have something I didn't answer, ask as I'm sipping these last few sips. When he says, Cliff was wonderful. Cliff was wonderful. It was such a pleasure. We unfortunately did not get to work more together. But it was an immense pleasure um, working those three times with Cliff and his team. He was very good at building a team. And I'm so happy because it was... I have not had the opportunity to work on TV yet or on the show. Or I haven't had the opportunity to direct a feature film so it was very nice to be in the position where I'm working with the full production team. And I'm very grateful that that was the case. So, um, yeah, that was really cool. And then since we uh, partnered up with Discover Long Island for one of those episodes, it was really cool working with them as well. Discover Long Island was a really cool company to work with. Which country has the best coffee? Says Magical. Italy, by far. Italy has the best coffee in general. Like, you'll find great coffee everywhere. But, um, best exceptional coffee, this might be a bit of a shocker, brace yourself, sit down, coffee lovers. In my opinion, the places that, the, the country that has Places that really excel in coffee amazingly well. Like, you'll have some great cups of coffee. Again, sit down. This might hurt some egos. Is England. So many of these small cities I've been in England, there was amazing coffee shops. Great, great coffee shops. So, Italy has great coffee everywhere. But England has some exceptional coffee all throughout the country. Like, you'll find really exceptional coffee. Sil says, I hope you do these philosophical chats for a long time. <laughs> yeah, Sil, yeah. You know, um, Sil. That's a great comment. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, I'm very curious for people tuning in right now. How's the coffee scene in Ireland? Asked Anthony. I loved it. Ireland is close to England in terms of you find really great coffee in many of its cities. It's not like Italy where a random gasoline station or a bakery or a bar, or a restaurant, or a tiniest village in the middle of nowhere, uh, or a ferry, or a train has great coffee. It, that's, that's the case in Italy. Literally, there's great coffee everywhere. Um, but in Ireland, the same thing with England, there is every single city or town has at least one really, really, really good coffee shop, in my opinion. Exceptional coffee shop. Um, so, Sil said, uh, I hope you do these for a long time. So, I'm very curious. For people who are tuning in, how do you envision your elderly life? I'm very curious. How do you envision your elderly life? Um, some people might be elderly who are tuning in. So let me know how you envisioned it when you were younger. But how do you envision it as an elder? 
Some people don't envision it at all. So some people just don't even envision themselves being elderly, which is very interesting. And sometimes that makes me wonder, uh, are they going to even live to that age if they don't see themselves elderly? Um, which is okay. Everyone lives a different life. Um, and then uh, you got a lot of people who, who kind of envision something a bit kind of... Uh, sometimes they envision the worst parts of being elderly. So they think about the back pain or health issues, glaucoma, whatnot. They think about the worst things. So I've had a lot of people say that. And then you got people who are, or, or sometimes a bit more simple, they are some more family oriented. They envision uh, hanging out, uh, hanging out with their grandchildren, being with their spouse, things like that. So everyone has a different plan for the elderliness. And in case says elderly, you know, I, I, okay, when I mean elderly, I mean very elderly. I mean uh, someone who's already late age. So I would say pushing 80 years old. Uh, for a lot of people that I think that we can all consider that as elderly is already once you start crossing 80. So of course not everyone has the opportunity to, cr to even get to that age. But it's an interesting exercise, I would say, to think about if you had the privilege, the opportunity, the good graces, the health, the luck, whatever way you want to appreciate it, uh, I think it's a good exercise to imagine how would you be elderly. And I think it will do you very good in life because especially if you can focus on more of those positive elements, A, you'll learn more about yourself, and then B, I think you'll increase the chances of those positive things happening. So uh, B. Good says, cycling, going to concerts in the park. Uh, Elizabeth says, I imagine never fighting for an L.A. parking spot. All right, touche. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, every moment is a surprise, says uh, Maureen. Hope to be healthy and have enough money for living and traveling, says Mika. Uh, and that says, I just hope to be healthy and sane. That's awesome. Uh, when I've passed, I want my loved ones and my acquaintances to say, man, that guy owed me a lot of money. <laughs> says Anthony. <laughs> man, that guy owed me a lot of money. <laughs> That's funny, Anthony. That's funny. Uh, Jeanette uh, imagines herself playing tricks and teasing. Veronique says, how do you envision it for you? I'll, I'll say that in a bit. Yes, I'm retired and enjoying life, says Maureen. Health problems are there, but I, I'm 73 years young. Hell yeah, Maureen, that's awesome. Uh, Ryan says, like, 80 years plus. I feel old already in two months. I turn 50, says Mark. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't go by age. It's how you feel on the inside. I will pray God grants me some more time to enjoy a sunset and smell the beach, says Leela. Oh, that's beautiful, Leela. That's awesome. Uh, Wendy says, I don't envision myself in my age. Uh, I see myself cruising my 70s, 80s with uh, posse-like minded travelers, footloose and exploring, says Mirna. That's awesome, uh, Mirna. That is amazing. Jenna says, I envision myself laid back. Joe says, 80 is the new 50. <laughs> uh, every moment is a surprise, says Maureen. Living for a few months in different countries and trying new cultures and food. There are enough places to see and writing books, painting pictures. I measure myself not aging, staying young physically, says Veronica. That is, that is a very admirable thing. I, I've heard some people say the same thing. It's very admirable. And it's true. That, I mean, you see some people in their 90s. They look like they're only 50. Uh, it can happen. So... That's awesome. Uh, Hisami says, I'm hoping I'm building a, a cool collection of things all around the world. And I feel my body cooperating as I, not cooperating as I, for 60. Oh no, I read. Hang in there. <laughs> Miraculous things can happen to the body. Who knows? Um, always yoga stretching, says Elizabeth. That's cool. So yeah, that's a lot. That's a awesome things. Uh, so for me, 
I've had this imagining since I was very little. Uh oh. Oh, my gimbal died. Oh, my gimbal's running out of battery. So I guess that's a cue to close out soon. So, let me finish this up. Ever since I was a very little kid, I imagined myself with a very long beard telling people stories, just chatting. It could, uh, like I envision it in all different scenarios, like telling little kids a story, um, telling people just, a, just generally having a nice dinner conversation um, or doing like a panel discussion for like an event just generally chatting with people and telling them stories with a very long beard. Uh, I'm very, wearing very kind of nice casual clothing, just very kind of loose clothing. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's how I, I envision myself in my very elderly age. So someone, uh, I forgot who just mentioned it, but the comment earlier said, uh, I hope you do these philosophical chats for a while, for a long time. And uh, yeah, I think I will, <laughs> because that's literally uh, how I envision my late age is, is doing this, quite literally. It'll, maybe it'll be different venues, maybe it'll be a different, maybe the audience will be very big, maybe the audience will be si tiny, maybe it'll just be a different scenarios. But uh, I, I envision myself chatting for the sake of chatting. So, uh, in the rocking chair, says Elmo. No, you know, I, you know, I, if I were to be very specific in this imagining, I usually envision myself sitting either on a chair and everyone's right huddled around me or cross-legged and people are huddled around me. That's how I envision it. So not, not in the rocking chair necessarily. <laughs> So not like in a familiar way, it's, it's not, it's not, so a lot of people envision elderly life with like surrounded by their grandchildren. I do envision having grandchildren, but, um, but no, I just envision telling people, just in general, people, stories. Mika says on the great bench, yes. Veronique says, that's also Marielle, the storyteller. Exercise as much as possible at every point in life, create, uh, Says, uh, says Anthony. Indeed, yeah. Do you envision, um, do you envision your late age by yourself? No. No, I mean, I envision telling the stories myself, uh, but no, no, not my own. No. Family, big family. Um, I will have, I will have, um, Dozens of grandkids. Dozens. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, my family's already getting big without me doing any of the work. So if you know me personally, you'll know more about that. But uh, yes, I envision having a big family. You think you, I think you should be a professor, says MK. I don't like too much the world of academia. I respect it. I like people who do it. I admire people who do it. I commend academics. I don't like it too much. Uh, I don't like academia too much. Um, and it takes a lot of work to be academic. I like the freedom of not being an academic. It's very nice. Just curious, what language do you learn at first? It was Spanish. Spanish I learned first. And English I started learning. When I got into kindergarten, I did not go to pre-K. When I got into kindergarten, I uh, did not um, know English. I knew a, maybe a word here and there because I used to binge watch uh, Saved by the Bell. So I maybe knew a few words, but I didn't know any English. Well, my first memory of kindergarten 
was trying to speak to little kids. As I mentioned, I was a very extroverted little kid. I, would, uh, I remember being so excited with my little backpack, super excited to go to my first day to school. Especially, you know, I'm only like five years old, so I, I'm or six years old. I'm watching this uh, show about high school, so that's my idea. Saved by the Bell was my idea of school. Uh, so I was so excited with my little backpack, and I go to the school. It's a very beautiful school. It's Our Lady of Fatima in, uh, in Jackson Heights, Queens, or you can call it East Helmers. depends on your definition. And I go sit down, put down my little backpack, sit down. It was like a long table of all these other kids. And remember, this area of Queens is very diverse, so there's kids from all different types of backgrounds there. And I'm like in the middle of the table and I'm super excited. And I start trying to talk to the little kids. And I look around and I'm shocked because I have no idea what people are saying. And no one knows what I am saying. Um, there was a few Hispanic kids in that class, but I don't think they were sat next to me at that first day. So I, I felt so alone that first day. I felt so left out. I was like, oh no, I don't know the language. I don't know the language at all. And then ever since then, I've had <laughs> a, I've had the goal of mastering the English language so well. <laughs> no, uh, but, but yeah, yeah, that first day I did not know the language. So I was, uh, I was, I, I felt so left out. But luckily I ended up learning English very quickly. It only took me uh, a few weeks, a few months, but I, I learned English super quickly. It was, it, it was no issue, no issue at all. So then I, I started connecting. I had a, a lot of good friends. I, I remember I started making friends that was the first day, but I think already in like the third week or so, I started making very good friends. That's nuts that they didn't have an ESL class. Yeah, I don't think I needed it. I'm not sure if they require it for kindergarten. That's a good question, Stephanie. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I have no idea why. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, it, I think it doesn't matter in kindergarten. I think where ESL, which means English as a second language, matters later. Uh, first grade, second grade, third grade. I think that's where, especially I think once you start going to like second grade, I think you really, if you don't know English, you do need to learn English more from a basic level. But I'm not sure, I'm assuming. But that wasn't my experience. I didn't go any, I didn't take any English second language courses. I just started in kindergarten. Sounds like English took over control. <laughs> it dictates your pitch and pace, uh, says Anthony. I do also have a certain, people have noticed that I talk in a sing-songy way. That sing-songy way of speaking, which I'm exaggerating right now, um, is not just a personal quirk. It comes from the Puerto Rican accent. And we have a few Boricuas tuning in. Someone earlier said earlier, uh, hello Boricua, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, it comes from Puerto Rican. If you, if you listen to Puerto Rican Spanish, people tend to speak in a sing-songy way. It's, pretty, it's a pretty sing-songy way of speaking Spanish. More so than a Dominican or, or a Mexican, for example. Spanish in general is more lyrical than other romance languages, definitely more lyrical than English, but I think Puerto Ricans tend to do a little bit more lyrically. Uh, Hisami says, I went to ESL in the fourth grade, but then uh, didn't know I had to take a bus in the middle of the day. Oh no, <laughs> that sucks Hisami. I was playing ESL even though English was my first language as MZ. You know, when I was in the fourth grade, Teachers, I, I spent one year in Puerto Rico, one entire year in Puerto Rico, and naturally I had to switch over to Spanish. So I learned Spanish extensively when I was there in third grade for Puerto Rico. 
And when I came back to the U.S., because uh, my family decided to move back to New York City, I uh, failed, not failed, but I didn't do as well in one of the tests to get back into public school at fourth grade. And the teachers wanted to send me to ESL. And I actually did ESL for like two weeks. And I remember it being so mind-numbingly boring because for me, uh, I knew English. So I, I, I get it that some people need to do ESL, but I didn't feel like I needed to do it. So I was so bored, so disengaged. And I remember t uh, the teacher getting really mad at me because I would just wasn't paying attention. And um, my parents had to interfere. They had to come in because uh, they were worried that I was not taking this seriously. They were worried that I was going to fail ESL. And my parents were like, our son knows English. <laughs> he doesn't need ESL. Why do you send him to ESL with our permission? So it was a big deal, and I got, uh, ultimately, I ended up taking a test. I got like a perfect score, and my parents, and they still wanted me to continue to sell. My parents were like, no, he got a perfect score. <laughs> Send them back to regular schooling, and luckily I ended up getting regular schooling. So I had two weeks of ESL. That was completely pointless. So ESL means English as a second language, which is normal in the U.S., uh, many public schools offer that. So, yeah, that was my experience with English as a second language. But yeah, the, the reason I speak a bit sing-songy is because it derives from Spanish slash, especially more Puerto Rican accent. Sometimes, peop uh, sometimes you think people are arguing, but they aren't because Spanish is so expressive. <laughs> that happens in Greek, that's for sure. Will you ever think of creating Urbanist Exploring Cities merch? I got to put up the link. Uh, MK, I already have merch. I've had merch for years. There are people out there. K, uh, I have many other people out there. Let me know if you're one of them. Sporting the merch. Wearing it proudly. I haven't put up the link in a while. But ooh, I got to start putting up the link again. Because I, I've noticed I have not been getting any merch sales. This is very bad, ladies and gentlemen. I have been, haven't been doing my job as a business person. Um, my merch, there's a Bob Cushion. Yeah, yeah, Wendy, yeah, there's a Bob Cushion. It's, it's up there. Um, there's Bob and Earl merch. There's Urbanist Tunes merch. There's a New York Urbanist merch. There's Rome Urbanist merch. So teespring.com slash stores slash urbanist. If anyone could put in the link, I would appreciate it. Teespring. T E E spring dot com slash stores slash urbanist. I gotta put on the link. Do I have the link? Let's see. Checking out through my uh, app. Wow, I haven't used this link in a while. No, no wonder no one has buy been buying anything. I was wondering why is no one ever buying any Bob t shirts anymore? Bob the Pigeon. I was, I was very sad. I was very sad that Bob the Pigeon was forgotten and no one bought Bob the Pigeon t-shirts. And, and I even have like a, like if you, if you have a newly born child, <laughs> I have like a infant pajamas of Bob the Pigeon and Earl the Squirrel. I have a lot of merch. I'm writing it down. All right. Right here, ladies and gentlemen, teespring.com slash stores. Thank you, Ron. Ron put up the link as well. Thank you so much, Ron. I love your sing-song way of speaking. Monotone is very boring for live videos. Yes, it is. It can be very calming. There are, there are some benefits to monotone speaking, but I, I think having a little bit more of a Cadence to your speech is a bit more fun. So everyone, teespring.com slash stores slash urbanist. Buy yourself a Bob t-shirt. Buy yourself a Bob the pigeon hat. Buy yourself a Bob pillow. Bob all day, every day. 
No, there's, there's other things. There's a little Statue of Liberty one. Uh, there is uh, the Urbanist Heart emoji. There's a lot of things that you can buy. You can buy a deluxe version of the albums as well. Two of the albums are deluxe versions are on Teespring. You can buy cool stuff. And also you can buy prints, uh, which is available on the other website, Dark, urbanist.darkroom.tech. Someone could write that one down as well. You can buy prints. And I'll be posting prints soon of Shamani. And there you can uh, put it on your office or your, your home or your workspace or give it as gifts to people who love those cities. And Susie says, you need urbanist magnets. Yeah, I, if there's an easy way I can make ma magnets, I would consider it. That's so interesting. Yeah, I, I've been... There's... Some places have really good postcards, but a lot of places have such terrible postcards. New York being one of them. New York postcards suck. There's a, there's a few good ones, and I've already sent them. But if, if people want more New York postcards... I'm sorry to say, but it's, it's really hard to find New York postcards. Uh, so when you receive a New York postcard as a mega urbanist, know that you are getting something that did not only take time to write, because I write my postcards, but also took me a lot of time to find. I had to dig for those postcards. Go to the little knick-knack shops in Brooklyn go to the deli that has their own postcards. Like I sent a few people Cat's Deli postcards or like uh, Strand Bookstore postcards. So I went to the most odd places to find postcards. Like Levain Bakery had a cool postcard of New York. But the only way you can find that is by going to Levain Bakery and somehow seeing it where it's not prominent because they don't care about selling it. They don't sell it. They give it for free. But um, I had to find all those little postcards. So if you get a New York postcard... <laughs> Be grateful, especially if you've been a long time mega urbanist. Be grateful that, uh, cherish that, please, because it, it took me a while to search it if you've been a long time mega urbanist. Uh, for now, they're on my fridge, uh, but eventually I will put them on display. Oh, cool. I sported a Statue of Liberty in my pick with the knee brace. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I saw that, Lurie. That was so cool. I'm so glad you wore an urbanist tee. Guilt viewers to buy it says Alamo. I don't know. I don't know the QVC uh, pitch. Cynthia says, are you getting drunk by yourself? Oh yeah, QVC. I've been drinking a mega pint. <laughs> no, I'm not drunk by myself. I only had a half bottle of wine. Pfft, this, is, this is nothing. Um, really, it's not, it's not that strong. 12%. Not that strong. Yeah. This is not this is not a full bottle of wine either. This is a like a third three fourths bottle of wine, seventy five cl. This is not even a full bottle of wine. This is like a wine pot. Some people drink this on their own for a casual dinner in France or in Italy. So it's not even that much. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for asking great questions. I hope you enjoyed the dinner. Uh, I hope you enjoy the, the merch. Again, teespring.com slash stores slash urbanist slash stores slash urbanist. And every dollar goes directly into my wallet. Uh, but for more videos about urbanists. <laughs> so thank you so much. I, I don't have some high-minded charity goals. I know some YouTubers out there do some fun things with charity with their merch. I'm not that big of a YouTuber yet, um, but it goes to give you more entertainment. So thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Have a great day. See you for another two more weekends in beautiful France for our final two weekends of Europe 2022. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Au revoir, mes amis. Au revoir. And yeah, that's the Urbanist Afterworld album. Check it out on YouTube. Au revoir.